Wednesdays. So we can really make sure the instruction that students are getting who didn't engage is as high quality as possible. So, so number one is teacher quality. Number two is uh, smaller class sizes. So where our regular teachers might have 16 students to 24 students on a caseload, teachers typically have eight to 12 in these schools because we want it to be one to one or two to one or three to one throughout the day as they can meet with students. And then lastly is just doing what you just said, Mrs. Flowers, is calling parents, reinforcing it, reinforcing it with community groups. I don't think there's one Zoom community meeting I haven't done where I've just reemphasized, please talk to your parents, talk to students, make sure that they're registered. And then from there, that dovetails into some of the later summer programs and school year programs that this money will help us do, which we don't have every detail quite worked out yet, but we will. And of the 20,000 students who are registered and are attending the Summer Bridge program, the 5,000 extra, we, we specifically targeted about 11,000 elementary students who we knew um, even going into the spring break and the COVID-19 must uh, attend our Summer Bridge program. So we, we circled back around to capture them and we set a goal, uh, actually the high percentage of that. So um, it, it should be never ending in terms of, of, of doing that. but that's going to be the achievement gap that's going to be the the heavy lift that uh, hopefully you'll see a very common theme and through all these presentations of how we're addressing some of our most marginalized students that really truly need to be um, and we need to prevent any type of slide from uh, academic slide the next slide that I, i'd like to just say that um, we, we are committed not only as a superintendent but the school board uh, if you go back to the slide, I, I, I did say next slide, so that's my bad. But uh, but uh, no, that's my this slide is is when you take a look at all of the partners, we are trying desperately, and and this is where I could use your help as a school board. Uh, you know, we, we're looking at leaders of the school, the health professions. We're meeting with doctors. Uh, Sarah O'Toole is here, and and she's a head of all of the nurses in our in our in our school district. She does a tremendous job. We have a mental health plan to re-enter school with Donna Cecilia, and she does a terrific job. CTE leaders, Mark Hunt has been doing a great job of some of the discussions of putting getting people credentialed and getting them back to work. Teacher leaders were partnered with our unions across the board, parent leaders, we're doing both. So all of these folks are truly making a piece and have a piece, law enforcement. And you see the box on the very bottom right-hand corner, that's their highlight because what they're saying to us, to each of the local school districts, and this is one of those areas that as a, Pinellas, as a district, Pinellas County has been extremely aligned with this. In fact, many districts have copied our model to, um, to engage in local health professionals, infectious disease doctors, pediatricians, and so forth. So the next slide now, you'll see the uh, Florida's education family, and it's kind of extensive. I mean, this is just a, a feel for what you see, um, you know, from virtual schools, uh, athletics started yesterday across the state, and uh, FHSAA, and, and uh, uh, all of the associations, uh, the Florida School Board Associations and so forth, state colleges, universities, technical colleges. So you just see these partners. So this is an indication of how we have to not only work collaboratively with all of these agencies in those boxes, but also in the larger picture with the state that we're, we're establishing those supports. And the next was uh, the next slide on page 42 really talks about the that dimmer switch concept that I mentioned in my opening comments is that the reopening of, of getting some youth activities back into, and this is a state plan, this isn't ours, I want you to keep that framework. And then in July, as Mr. Hendrick has mentioned, maybe trying to expand some of the face-to-face, -face. we're looking at some face-to-face -face reading recovery and small group of instructions in July, and then August moving into it, all at the same time of having to keep an eye and, and, and stay hitched to the medical profession in terms of how the virus is doing and how we're experiencing it as a, as a state if we could continue to move forward. So with that, I wanna talk, um, turn this over to um, Mr. Herbeck, I believe is up next, who's gonna talk um, ab about some of the bricks and mortar or, or nuts and bolts, I call it, of, um, of our, our back to school plan. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Grego. And as Dr. Grego said, uh, the next five slides really do deal with the physical preparations and some of the daily practices and some of those adjustments we need to make. 
uh, to prepare for the um, reopening of school and to the, for the return to work. And really, um, it centers on three things. You'll hear me kind of repeat these um, three themes throughout these slides. It talks about um, how we need to educate our workers and our students, in fact, all stakeholders, um, about what the new normal um, of schools will be, um, how we're going to protect all stakeholders, and then also how we need to be able to adapt to the changes that inevitably uh, will come up. So as we start with this on, on uh, slide 45 here, it really does talk about, and on the left-hand side there, I, I like that that they put down there. It's really talking about showing everyone what safety looks like. And I kind of, it, it took me back to the first time um, I visited um, a Publix um, and I walked in and I saw the, the, the one-way markers on the floor, the, the shields and everything else. And you kind of walk through there the first time, if you go back there and you, you stood there and well, what do I do next? And uh, you had to almost learn, relearn how to move and operate through a Publix. We all did that very quickly. I think that's what the return to school, the return to work will be like. And so I kind of want to kind of think about that to get to the point where we go to those stores right now and it's almost become second nature. Uh, that's what we want our schools to be able to look like in August. So um, as with safety, as with physical safety, um, safety does start at the front door. And this slide does talk about that a little bit. And so what, what three things that we're really going to focus on in setting the tone of what schools will look like uh, to start off with will be um, signage and barriers. And I know we have an example of a sign there on the door um, as you come in uh, behind Mrs. Long. And I think, I can't read it from here, but I think that's talking maybe about social distancing. But uh, we're, we've um, made signs, we're gonna distribute signage to all of our schools, to all of our workplaces, to encourage people and to remind people what the social distancing rules are, uh, what the best practices are, reminding them to wash and um, sanitize their hands, wear face masks, all the things that we've become used to, we're gonna push those out to our schools. We also are fortunate in our schools and um, in our workplaces that um, over the years, as you all know, we have the safety barriers in place, those glass barriers. Um, those are gonna act uh, perfectly as sneeze guards. Uh, we don't have to go in as Publix and other places did and put up um, additional materials. Those do act very well for that purpose. Uh, we are doing an inventory right now of all of our district um, uh, facilities to make sure if there are any gaps in there, if we have any places where an employee may be um, greeting the public without a guard in front of them, that we can make those. And in fact, Mr. Hewitt and his shop and maintenance are able to make those sneeze guards out of plexiglass and they are pumping those out um, whenever people ask for those. So we will be able to close all those gaps as well and protect our employees. For employees, students, uh, staff, everyone alike, um, the other thing that we need to be able to do is protect them, um, either through, um, again, um, soap, hand sanitizers, uh, face masks, gloves, uh, whatever personal protection equipment they need. Uh, we've been able to secure um, pretty large quantities of those. We're, we're scouring the supply chains virtually every day, making sure that we have enough uh, for the start of school and beyond. And uh, we don't certainly want to run out a week after school starts. We're, we're still uh, collecting all that in for, or collecting all those materials and um, storing those in a warehouse. Um, but that protection and, and that degree is extremely important as well. And then the last thing about um, really creating these visible safe zones is our daily practices. It's getting people to really uh, do the best they can to adhere to the social distancing uh, requirements. It's doing things like setting up one-way hallways or one-way staircases in some of our schools to make sure that that crossing um, is not going on as much and people are moving in one direction. And again, helping um, to just to establish those, those new daily practices that are um, best, best practices, I should say, uh, to help keep people um, as safe as possible. Our next slide is really addressing, um, as you can see, the mitigation strategies for employers. And we're talking about, um, and, and for us, that includes students and staff at schools as well. But three things we're going to focus on on this area. And again, you can see some bullets there um, on the, on the uh, right-hand side. But it really kind of boils down to three things. And the first is health screening and monitoring our employees' health and well-being. We want to make sure that we start off with um, in any campaign about health screening is to remind people if they're not feeling well to stay home. 
and to work with their supervisors um, when those cases come up. But we've also been very fortunate. I know a lot of you know that um, we contracted with Identikid for our visitor management system a little over a year ago. Some of you know their president, Rick Hagan, here um, in St. Petersburg. His children went to our schools, Lakewood High School. Um, we've reached out to them to see if they would be able to assist us in developing a health monitoring school or tool for our employees. And they were able to do that in a matter of days. And so we have a very easy system right now for our employees to be able to log in, um, inform us that they are feeling well, and if they're not feeling well, what their symptoms are, we can track that, we can uh, monitor that, we can send, um, if, if need be, I know that um, Sarah is working on this as well, uh, give those employees um, assistance if they're not feeling well. But most importantly, we have a way very quickly for our employees to check in every day before they come to work and say, I'm fine. I don't have any of these symptoms and it's done in a matter of about 10 seconds. Another thing that um, this page uh, or this slide addresses is again, the reinforcement of social distancing uh, whenever possible. Um, it does uh, start talking about uh, possibly staggering schedules. It talks about making sure that um, um, if, if work schedules need to be adjusted so you don't have clustering at things like a time clock or things like that, that we should make those adjustments and we have done that already. And another thing that this uh, slide talks about is uh, frequent cleaning of work areas during the day. We've established cleaning patrols that I'll talk about a little bit later on this morning um, with our plant operators at all schools and district uh, work locations that ensure that during the day, we will have plant operators going around, wiping down door handles, wiping down high touch uh, surfaces, making sure that our employees are protected and they feel a little bit more comfortable touching those surfaces throughout the day again, as long as they're using hand sanitizer and, or soap uh, shortly afterwards. Slide 50 starts talking about, again, uh, recommendations to reduce at the front door. Again, we greet all of our um, visitors, whether it's this building or schools at the front door. Uh, we've been able to do that through our physical uh, protection. And um, this, this page really, again, focuses on a couple of key areas. Starts off with education. We have to make sure that uh, we educate not only um, our visitors, but our employees as well. Our employees now have set up, um, and there is a course, an online course that they can take. There's a video that they watch, and to make sure that they know all the proper COVID-19 uh, work-related precautions. Again, social distancing comes up, um, washing your hands, wearing masks um, and gloves are all included in that. But also the education piece comes up with signage. Some of our visitors to our schools obviously will not have an opportunity to watch that video. Uh, so we wanna put signage out there reminding them that when they walk through that door, there are going to be certain expectations and you know, reminding them that there will be sneeze guards in place and reminding them that um, that if they go beyond the, um, the, the secure part of the school, uh, they will have a health screen, um, a voluntary health screening um, uh, question, again, through Identikid provided for them. We also are going to provide protection, as this slide talks about, uh, talking about the personal protection equipment uh, for all employees. Again, we've talked about that over and over here today with sneeze guards, sanitizer, and PPE. One of the things that this slide though does talk about and starts hinting at it is to reduce clustering of employees, of guests, and we'll take it a step further of students once the school day starts. And so again, this is where they start talking about making those recommendations of staggering schedules. Uh, and I'll give you an example of how that may work in our maintenance department. Um, our maintenance team comes in about 300 people. Generally in the past, they've all come in at the same time and they've left at the same time. Uh, there's, you know, if you're Walter Pinnell, about three o'clock, you see them all moving as one uh, toward, their, toward their vehicles. To reduce clustering, Mr. Hewitt has staggered their schedules by about 10 to 15 minutes apart. So you don't have hundreds of people walking through that door. Right now you have a handful or so. And they've been able to do that and it's, it has helped. I watched it yesterday in action. And you do now have a kind of a trickle of people heading out. They still have their full work day. Uh, but he's been able to adjust those uh, schedules to make sure that, again, they're not clustering and, um, and uh, endangering each other by breathing on each other for being too close. And then the last thing, again, this slide talks about, especially at our school level, is to control the flow of visitors. 
Uh, we already do that, uh, I think, very effectively in Pinellas County Schools uh, through our visitor management system. So I don't think that will be a huge challenge for us. Um, but again, I, I did want to kind of point out one thing. It talks about controlling the flow of visitors, not stopping the flow of visitors. Uh, I don't know if we've made, a, a, again, firm decisions yet on volunteers and mentors and their, um, their ability to come on campus and work with students. That's something, again, I think we're still vetting a little bit more, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that has to stop. The next page on page 51, um, again, it's kind of starting to repeat itself. <laughs> and so again, we're talking about social distancing to the greatest extent possible. Um, and again, when you look at the check marks on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, similar things that you saw on, on some slides earlier. But a couple of things that we really want to talk about on this one is that uh, we've started working with our HPOs, with our principals, and, um, and, and with our teachers as well. What we want to do is to social distance to the greatest extent possible in all of our classrooms. That means when you walk into our classrooms now, especially at the elementary school level, you will see uh, little clusters of students and sometimes they put three and four in a little square. They arrange their desks in a little square and the, and the, and the students work together um, um, throughout the day. What we need to do with social distancing in classrooms is now to spread those students out as far as we can apart. Hopefully we can get to a six, six foot distance between them, but in a lot of cases, we won't be able to do that. So what we've asked student or again, schools to do is to identify non-essential furniture, the furniture that you don't really need to use every single day, to identify that, remove it from the classroom and keep the essential furniture, which is the student work area, the teacher desk and work area, and maybe one of the, um, uh, I know in elementary schools, the semicircular reading tables, and keep those in place and spread everything out as far as we can. So that again, that you have some distance between students, uh, you have the freedom of movement as well in the class and the teacher can still work um, with the students as effectively as possible. But that bunching up um, that we've seen in the past is something that we're gonna work very hard on to, um, to not have in place this current year. We're also gonna be setting up a sick room and I, uh, it's about halfway down, I think on, on your bullet points there. And the sick room is different from the clinic. We know that during the school day, students are still going to go to see the nurse because they don't feel well, or they fell down and they have a cut or a scrape or something like that. And they need to be able to still go and visit the school nurse. However, we also anticipate that during the school day, there may be staff members or students alike come to the clinic and say, I don't feel well, I have a fever, or I have um, one of the other symptoms of COVID-19. If that's the case, we want to separate them from the more minor um, injuries and, and needs to visit the clinic and create a sick room where those students and staff members can go wait. The students can wait till their parents come and pick them up. Staff members can wait until they um, have an opportunity to go home or get checked out a little bit closer. But uh, setting up this sick room is something that, again, we've worked with um, our head plant operators. They are identifying those rooms right now. And we're working on getting them the proper equipment in there, whether it's tables, chairs, cots, whatever the case may be, uh, that people do have a sick room. And then the last thing this slide talks about is really, again, uh, going to what I'll talk about a little bit later, is cleaning during the day, that routine cleaning of, of um, high touch areas during the day. Um, and then slide 53 is talking about, uh, is really addressing the same type of classroom issues we just talked about and how we need to change our practices um, surrounding the classrooms, moving that to athletic events. So again, um, our approach will be that we will approach that in the same uh, manner as we've approached classrooms. We'll have the pr protection, uh, we'll have the sanitizer and the hand cleaning station set up. But one of the big changes that you see down there and about halfway to three quarters of the way down you start talking about um, considering setting up um, social distancing at athletic events. You know, families can sit together, uh, but families, uh, different families members need to be, uh, or different families, I should say, need to be six feet apart. So controlling the crowd numbers and controlling when the crowds arrive, it's gonna be hard to control when the crowds leave, but we may have to um, um, uh, exit um, arenas uh, or, um, football stadiums, especially in, in gymnasiums, much like you do with an airplane and say, okay, row one, two, three, four, and five, go out that door. These rows go out the other. But again, we're working on different ways that we can uh, accommodate fans to still attend to our, our games in the fall. 
as you can see, much of this area that Mr. Herbig's discussed, we're going from the plan into, um, we're not only dabbling, but we're diving knee deep into some of the actions that we are doing. I wanna um, just pause here for a second and say that the numerous discussions we've had with our medical professionals has truly helped this process as many of them have children and students in our school district that they understand that schooling and social distancing sometimes is, is uh, impossible. So we're gonna continue to insert some of their suggestions as, as they, they've been truly very, very helpful in, in, uh, in, in this discussion. And the other part uh, before we turn over to Dr. Corbett is uh, just as a reminder on this page is talk about graduations. I've asked uh, Dr. Vasquez and, and, and also uh, Ms. Matway to provide an update to this board as we're finalizing our plans for graduations at the end of this. So um, and we will cover that too in terms of, uh, and let me also thank Dr. Cho uh, in this because he has been on the phone with me at least once or twice a week um, in terms of uh, just discussing how things are going in our county, um, what he's comfortable with and certainly um, lead him. And, and he's been very, very instrumental to, uh, to the guidance of this, whether it be graduation, sporting events, or, or just understanding and taking the time for he and his staff to truly walk through our schools and see what's, what's reasonable, what's gonna give you the greatest safety return for your actions. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Corbett. All right, and I get to talk about our favorite topic, these, these little masks that we're all carrying around with us lately. Um, it's probably a topic that has generated the most discussion both inside our organization and outside our organization. There's two slides in this presentation that speak specifically about masks and on slide 54, uh, in the state plan, they're very clear, they are not mandating masks. Thank you, sir. But they are not mandating masks. However, they recommend that you look at using them to the maximum extent possible. And then they talk about specific areas where you may need them such as buses or events and meetings and, and, and different things. They do talk about cloth masks being the, the, the way to go because the N95 mask should be reserved for the medical community. And though, then over on page 58, <clears throat> they talk about where social distancing is not feasible and they talk about class size and busing, then that's when you should consider using masks. Right? That's basically the, the gist of slide 58. I wanna remind you that the state plan is not a mandate it's simply a set of recommendations and they wholeheartedly suggest that local districts make local decisions that meets the needs of your community. So we've been talking about how do you balance social distancing and wearing masks? That's really where, what it boils down to. The goal of everything we're doing right now is to try and minimize the risk of spread of the virus, right? So in the fall, we're gonna have 100,000 people coming back to 130 buildings. And so our question and our task is, so how do we balance things? I mean, we can look around this room right now, there's probably 20 people in the room and less than half are wearing masks. But that's because we've managed to meet social distancing guidelines in the room, but still there's some people may or may not be comfortable with it. So we want anybody who wants to wear a mask to be able to wear a mask. But that question becomes, so where can't we do it? Uh, we use busing as an example. In order to social distance on a bus, we can put nine, maybe 10 kids on a bus. That's not feasible for us. That's not something we're gonna be able to pull off. So if we wanna be safe on a bus, we're gonna to have to insist on everybody on the bus wearing a mask. That's the only way we can, we can provide some level of safety. So these are the decisions that we're trying to make about masks. And, and I will talk more about it when, when I get into our return to work presentation later. But what I did wanna let the board know is that we will be um, recommending next week on your agenda, we will be recommending the purchase of 500,000 masks so that we can offer every student and every employee who wants them five cloth masks that they can then launder throughout the year. And we will be able to pay for that. Um, 87, Mr. Smith will go over this later, but 87 and a half percent of that is reimbursable through FEMA. And the remainder will, is a legitimate expense we can use with our care dollars. So more to come about masks, but again, it, it's, it's, what we told our employees for return to work over the summer was, yeah, you don't have to wear your mask in your office. You don't have to wear your mask in your cubicle. You don't have to wear your mask when you're eight feet apart, but you get up and you go to walk somewhere and you're gonna be walking by other people or you're gonna be in any situations where you're not able to do social distancing, then the best thing we can do to protect ourselves or protect others from ourselves 
put the mask on. Thank you. So the, it's an interesting conversation as I discuss these concepts with superintendents throughout the state <coughs> of Florida. And as, as we have these interactions with our medical professions, uh, professionals, um, it is unbelievably, I, I was very surprised the unison uh, opinion, I mean, it's very strong opinion. You know, they say, we, we hear all these things about schedule this and kids in, leaving in and out, A, B schedule and all this. They said, and these are parents, uh, also medical professionals. I don't know how you're going to do that. And, and you'll send the community in a whirlwind. If you want to do one thing that will give you the greatest return on safety, just one thing, forget about the hallways one way and all this stuff, just put on a face mask. And you'll, you'll solve 75% of your problems right off the bat. There's no other greater measure. And this is from the medical profession. That's why this is not us, this is them. There's no other single thing you can do. Now, is it where every single minute of every single day of every, you know, we, we get that, you know, like, like us. Uh, if I go into a, a Publix or a Home Depot, I, pu I put one on. The second I get out and, and smell the fresh air, <laughs> I take it off, you know. And, and, or if I get in the car by myself, I, 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 I obviously don't have it on. But, you know, these are things that as we, we go through it, and I asked the doctors, you know, how is it? And the pediatrician said, you know, the kids are pretty adaptive. He says, the young people come to my office and, and, and they're sitting there and they say, is it okay to take my mask off? Yes, you're in the doctor's office. They need to look down your throat, you know, and they're healthy. So, you know, I, I, I think students are going to be just fine with this in, in terms of that, because it's something that we have this summer and it's become the, not, we say, I don't like the term new norm, but as you see it in our, our community, it's the one way to fight the spread of this and, and uh, our children are, are understanding it. But let me emphasize one word that we should really continue to, we have to educate, we have to continue to educate not only our students because they're, they're pretty adaptable, but also the adults. One of the strongest things, and I'm gonna turn this over to um, back to Clint and Sarah O'Toole and is that um, we have to, the, 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 the best screening for our students, our parents, the best screen. We could screen all day. We could take these temperatures on, but the best person and the best screening are the parents before they send the student off to school. Um, so with that, I think we're going back to Mr. Herbick on uh, slide uh, 50, 55. And as you see, board members, these numbers are sporadic because we're pulling in from that 148 page slide. Uh, Yes, Mr. Herbert. Yes, thank you again. Uh, again, this slide, um, it kind of, uh, I kind of questioned it a little bit with the student, especially the uh, drop off in the morning. Um, I, I, my 27 whatever years of as a teacher and administrator in a high school, I never really saw um, a clustering of students in the morning. Uh, it naturally is staggered. They they get in through the front door. Uh, they either go to the cafeteria or uh, where they're going to meet their friends. And in elementary school, I see the same thing. Um, I see uh, people arrive at different times and students may cluster in their classroom or in the cafeteria. So I don't think that we're going to have a big um, issue with uh, drop off uh, with clustering. We will put hand stations again at those entrances. We will uh, expand the number of entrances. I know a lot of schools try to kind of uh, reduce the number so that they can monitor the traffic for uh, physical safety. Uh, but we may uh, in increase the number of those drop-off um, access points to campus. Um, and again, those will all be monitored by an adult throughout the day as well. So they can help and they can remind the students as they come in, use the hand sanitizer before you walk through the gate or before you walk through the door. The afternoon may be a little bit more challenging. Um, afternoon dismissal, as everyone knows, a bell rings and everybody moves uh, toward wherever their destination is, a car or a bus. But every school also has a rainy day plan every single school that I know of does. And uh, we may not have to institute that every single day, but it may be a very good starting point to start at the beginning of the school year and see how that dismissal works uh, till we find something that really does um, de-emphasize the clustering of students after school. Uh, no matter what we do, I know that there will be an issue that our, our high schools will be uh, presented with that uh, no matter how well you push students off multiple entrance or exits on a high school campus, 
they will be clustering at their cars in a parking lot. <laughs> and so that will be a whole nother uh, challenge, but we are already working on that. Um, I've talked to Chief Williams about some ideas that we can put in place in parking lots to get students out and especially get the traffic moving. You know, students will stand outside if the cars aren't moving, but if the cars are leaving, they'll get in their cars and leave as well. So uh, he may be working, I know, I know he, not may, he is working with some municipalities to try to get that flow of traffic out of high school parking lots a little bit more effectively. The next slide though, um, page, or number 56, is really kind of um, uh, something that we've put a lot of work into the last um, several weeks and especially our general managers of operations and, um, and Mike Hewitt have worked very closely with, um, with our HPOs in developing cleaning protocols for all of our schools and district workspaces. They've been able to put together a little pamphlet, cleaning for a healthier Pinellas County schools. And in this pamphlet, which we will share not only with our HPOs and principals, we will share this with all of our teachers and staff members, as well as, as, well as parents, um, it details exactly how we're going to clean each room. It details the, the type of materials and equipment we will be using to clean and the frequency. And so what we have decided to do is we're going to start with a very defined cleaning protocol, how we will clean schools and workplaces before the return to work or before the return to school in the summertime. So it'll be a really an enhanced summer cleaning uh, more than what we normally do. We then have uh, very defined protocols on how we're going to clean every classroom and workspace at night. Uh, this is gonna be a change of practice for us. In the past, we basically have kind of turned it over to HPOs and we've said every classroom needs to be cleaned. Uh, we've told them, you know, floors carpeted, trash dumped out, um, other things wiped down. And we haven't defined a schedule for them. What we're asking them to do now is from this point forward, every single night, to clean in a very prescribed protocol. Here's what you do when you walk in the room. This is the first step, the second step, all the way to when that plant operator does the last step and he, he or she locks that door, every step of that way will be defined. By doing that, what we're going to get is consistency and cleaning from every classroom from, from Lakewood to Tarpon Springs. And every classroom will be cleaned in the same, in the same manner. When those classrooms are also, when they're cleaned, the plant operator will be hanging a little um, tag on the doorknob, kind of like what you see in a hotel. The tag will say this room has been cleaned and sanitized and is ready for use. We hope what that will do is create confidence in our staff members and our students as well, to have the confidence in knowing that that room was cleaned last night and it was cleaned following the established protocols. We've also taken those protocols, we put them in a list and we will be giving those to every single teacher for them to keep in their classroom. And they can go in every single day and they can, and we're not gonna fill this checklist out every night. We're just gonna give that to them and say, here's how your room was cleaned. Here are the things that were cleaned last night. And they can go back to again to this document and find out exactly how all the things on that checklist were cleaned. And again, what we're hoping that does is it provides again that confidence that things were cleaned appropriately. The third thing we're going to do, and I've, I've referenced it earlier, we are going to um, um, have our HPO set up cleaning patrols throughout the day. So they will have a plant operator and the HPO themselves go around campus with chemicals, with rags, wiping down door handles, wiping down elevator buttons, high touch surfaces, especially like in the front office of schools. Um, they will be checking every single restroom um, on, a, on, a, uh, on a time, like again, on a routine, making sure that there is soap and paper towels in every single restroom and replenishing those supplies if they start running low. And then the last thing that uh, the GMs and Mr. Hewitt worked on is um, protocols for how to clean a school or workspace if either if those spaces have a confirmed case of COVID-19. There is a specific protocol to follow Again, it follows industry standards and it follows the guidelines established by um, the CDC. Um, all of those cleaning of those spaces, and again, the spaces, uh, when you look through this document, we've defined there's a different way to clean a clinic than there is a classroom. There's a different way to clean a classroom than there is a PE locker room and so forth. Those have all been established and those protocols uh, defined in here. They've worked again, like I said earlier, with the HPOs to, to identify those. But the other things that they did is they went out then and practiced those protocols. 
They took plant operators, went to school, practiced the protocols step by step, timed how long it would take to clean each of those rooms, filmed it so that we can use it for a training uh, video for our plant operators in the future, and also filmed it so that, again, teachers and parents and staff members, again, can see the depth that they're do, uh, going through to clean these rooms, again, promoting that confidence uh, that will be needed in the fall. And then the last thing that they're doing with our HPOs, and again, this is going to be a change in the way that we work. They have developed extremely detailed schedules for every plant operations team member. Instead of just telling you know, Mr. Smith to say, hey, go clean that portion of the campus and let me know when you're done. What they've done now is they said uh, back and they've given Mr. Smith say 10 classrooms and they know it takes him 20 minutes to clean each one. And he has a schedule now throughout the day, every 20 minutes go to a different classroom if you've been able to clean it effectively. And we'll be able to, again, monitor the cleaning of that, making sure that every room was cleaned appropriately, um, and also be able to use those schedules um, uh, to help schools if they do run short. If somebody calls in sick, we know how much help to send them. Um, if, if, again, a plant operator or somebody else gets sick or they're on vacation. The last page, page 57, again, is pretty much a repeat of what you see on, uh, saw on page 56, the previous page. Um, well, the one thing I did want to point out on this one, though, is it talks about making a plan to clean and disinfect. Um, one thing that we're looking at is a monitoring tool that uh, we'll be able to give to our head plan operators and our principals. And um, on that, they can go and check every single day um, how clean the rooms were. Uh, it's a little um, program, and basically it's on your iPad, and you check. You basically walk in, and you can use the checklist here. Um, see very quickly if the room was cleaned according to plan and they can monitor again uh, and and have data on the effectiveness of the cleaning protocols that took place the night before and we should have that in place by by fall thank you mr herbert Is, were you finished yeah okay thank you um uh, clint I, sounds like a, a great plan but are we going to have to hire more people no, and that's one of the things that they did to go through that schedule. Uh, that's why they timed all of those rooms. And what they're doing right now is they're going through, as the HPOs are developing their schedules, what we're looking at right now, the, the hope is just to adjust hours um, or adjust staffing um, across different schools. But from what they've discovered so far is they have enough people right now in our current staffing model to be able to do that. The one change may be is a slight change in hours of a night person more toward the day. Uh, to be able to assist with the daily cleaning patrol during the day. Typically, like in in a high school, they have certain people assigned to a section of the building. You know, like you get a wing, you got a hallway, that's right. your hallway. Now one person's going to have to clean all those rooms in the protocol, is that what you're saying? Correct. And again, that's, that, that was a concern that was brought up as soon as they started developing those is how many more people we need. And they went out with HPOs. And, and again, that's the whole reason that they practiced and timed this. And they did that at several schools. I know um, I think Terry Huberti, Jerry Reynolds, and Marvin Jefferson all grabbed people themselves and timed it kind of independently of each other. So uh, they were able to com compare those um, the times it took to clean those rooms and 20 minutes was fairly consistent. Well, it seems to be, there's going to be a lot of pressure put on the head plan operator. There is. And again, one of the changes that we'll see is traditionally um, in our county, head plan operators and night foremen um, have kind of moved away sometimes for, from the cleaning efforts. And you, a lot of times you don't see, and it's not true everywhere. You know, there's a lot of head plan operators and night foremen that still take part in cleaning duties but that is still part of their job description and they're gonna to have to take on a few more of those cleaning duties than they have in the past couple of years. So the head plan operator ultimately is responsible, not the night foreman or the night. Correct, correct. And if a teacher comes in in the morning, even though the tag is hanging on the door and find some discrepancy, would she or he be able to Yes, and that's again one of the reasons why we are going to make that film available to them and as well as the checklist. We want the teachers to know what the protocol is 
and to know how their room is clean so that if they see something that wasn't done, uh, they would report that immediately to the HPO and to an administrator. Yeah, typically, I think the, the biggest complaint has to do with carpeting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, you get all those desks and, and it, you know, they tend to get a little sloppy when they're doing their, their vacuuming and, and uh, carpeting holds so much crap. I mean, that's where half the bacteria resides in the carpeting. And uh, so, okay, it's gonna be a good challenge. I'm anxious to see how that works. Thanks. Yeah. Ms. Long and then Dr. Carr. Mr. Herbeck, I might be jumping ahead with, with the cleaning. What about the protocol for the buses? Uh, good point. The, the buses uh, will be cleaned um, with the same type of chemicals we're using in the classroom. It's a chemical called Quat 256. Mm -hmm. It is on the CDC list of approved chemicals to uh, kill um, COVID-19. And um, But they will be the high touch surfaces, the rail, and the seats, and the seat backs, and even the windows uh, will be wiped down between runs. And okay. uh, again, at the end of the night, so it's ready to go in the morning. Uh, we're also putting um, either hand sanitizer or waterless soap um, dispenser on the buses as well for, and encouraging students to use that as they get on and off. Is this going to add a little bit of a time to the run because they have to stop disinfect the bus before they pick up the next group? It, it won't add time to the run, um, but I, I know that uh, transportation is working on sometimes a, a, a bus turns around and I mean they might drive a couple blocks and they're ready to pick up the student for the next run. It's going to increase that time a little bit, so they are working on the, the, those Adjusting adjustments. Adjusting the yeah. okay. Okay, Dr. Carr. I have a similar question to Mr. Dudley with the number. I know you timed it, but that may have been not after the classroom was just used, and you know we leave it oftentimes in so much disarray. And our the are, were we not using like a square footage to determine the allocation by building? And so now we're asking all these folks to do additional things and having visited our schools in the past and had particular concerns, I think it, before we even closed with soap replacement throughout the day and, you know, so many families expressing that concern. And if we had, do we have a team of people who will be specially trained to go in when there is an infection or will the regular plan operators be expected to do this deep level of cleaning at the same, you know, with the same staffing ratio. So let's say I have to close for three days or whatever the um, health department determines for us. If there's an infection and we have to close a building, are those head plan operators, what if they themselves are quarantined? then will we have another team? You know, sometimes in our TZ zones, we have our on-deck teachers. Will we have a similar model for our cleaning crew? Because I could see potentially having a need for that. Um, and I, it does concern me how they're gonna get it done, having been an AP in an elementary and dealing with a fantastic head plant operator, so, but who yeah. did do cleaning. So the, um, the first how we part, get it all done. <laughs> yeah. The first part that the, the kind of questioning the 20 minutes versus the square footage. Um, we, we have always assigned plant operators according to square footage from um, American Physical Plant Association guidelines, APPA. And um, what they found is that the timing and the square footage uh, was remarkably similar. The, the classrooms that they did clean um, in practice, they did have is a standard classroom. They threw stuff on the floor. Uh, they put stuff on the desks, you know, crayons and stuff like that. They did dirty up the room before they okay. did it. And again, I've looked at the spreadsheets that they've gone over and um, uh, they, and, and I can sh obviously share those with you, but it, it has the difference of staffing model. If you want pure square feet and the difference in staffing model with using this timing method and it's remarkably similar uh, with the staffing. The uh, about cleaning and uh, after a positive COVID-19 case, yes, we have a strike team set up. That strike team will be district personnel, specially trained uh, to clean at a higher level uh, with um, more equipment. Um, they'll use, a, we call it the Clorox 360 machine. It's 
basically an electrostatic sprayer that comes in and we set it up in the room. And it's since those particles are charged, uh, it basically shoots out a mist in the room, 360, and that um, electrostatic charge will even adhere to the bottom of a desk. And so you basically, it's not just sanitize, it's not just cleaning, it's sanitizing. And um, that's really the key to it. So the district strike team uh, right now, I think we have 10 to 12 people on it, uh, ready to go. And again, they have specially trained, uh, they have all the correct PPE and they are they're ready to go. We've, we've had a district strike team for a long time. We, we actually uh, use them for, um, I think S1N1 and um, one other little flu outbreak I remember several years ago. Thank you. Other okay. questions? I think that's it. But before we go on to the next piece, we've been asked for a five minute technical break. That's up to you. <laughs> this is, you said at the end of the whole presentation. I thought it was this section. Okay, I misunderstood. Go ahead. So board, <laughs> board members, as you see, what we're doing is we, we're, we're going back and forth. We're in tremendous alignment with these recommendations. And as was noted, there's nothing of a mandate that you'll ever hear from the state's plan, but rather a reliance on good judgment and the, the doctors that are, that are working with us, especially in the area of cleaning also. The, the areas that we tap them the most are the areas of um, where social distancing is very difficult, such as lunchrooms and others. And they're giving us some great suggestions. You know, in elementaries, we walked in and they said, well, if you can keep this cohort of 16 students together all day and they're all healthy, this is a very safe, healthy environment. Um, and if they then add on to the face mask and their abilities to wear it to the greatest extent possible, wow, this is really a healthy environment. We went to some elementary schools where the cafeterias are large. The, the, the tables are all facing in one way. They said, you could just come here and separate the students. It's actually a greater separation than having lunch in the classroom, which is a, certainly a solution for some schools with small cafeterias. So I'm just trying to paint the picture that a one decision, one size fits all isn't gonna work, but rather we, we have strategic plans set up with our principals and cafeteria workers and others. It might be better for students to go, obviously you can't wear a face mask when you're eating. Um, I haven't tried, but uh, it, it, but the 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 the, the, con the concept there is 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 that if we can give the students a break and maybe like a face mask break, or go outside and walk and and have some play time, that's very important to us. So these are these are inputs and suggestions that we continue to get. We don't have all the answers today, is my point. But I, okay, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I. I think elementary schools are going to be a lot easier. The problem, yeah. I, I think, comes in secondary because you have kids at work. Right. And there's a greater threat of... Um, Social distancing is a lot more difficult with secondary students. Oh, yeah. <laughs> with, the, with the class period changes and so forth. Without a doubt. Be the, I think it's going to be a real challenge. So like in one of the uh, infectious disease doctors who both have children in middle schools and in Lakewood, in fact, uh, she said, well, then I'm going to insist that my child wears a face mask because he can remedy all of that, you know, regardless of hall directions and all this stuff. None of that matters if you just put if it, not some, but everyone, you know, so, but you're, you're absolutely right, um, Mr. Dudley, is that in the secondary uh, schools are a lot more challenging because of this lack of um, social isolation. It, it is a it is a social uh, sport, and and I'm I'm looking at Sarah O'Toole. She's been a part of these committees. Uh, she's been trem a tremendous asset to the school district. Um, you know, I wasn't here with H1N1, but I, I I know that you're you you've worked through that. You've worked through so many um, health issues. So here's another one. And uh, we're going to continue to support you, your whole department and, and nurses are just a tremendous uh, kind of an unsung hero in our school district. So thank you for, for uh, always promoting them and, and singing their praise. But um, Sarah's works uh, daily with the Department of Health and is in our next segment of discussion here. Okay. And um, Ms. Kane has her hand raised for a question. So Lisa, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, I just in all the discussion of lunchrooms, we talked a lot about elementary. What What is the plan for secondary for lunchrooms? Because they often have a lot more kids than elementary at the same time. And I'm not sure if 
classroom lunch is a possibility there? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We're going to go uh, high school by high school. Uh, some of the suggestions by our medical professionals is to start to open up outside tables and being outside is great uh, because it, it reduces the, the likelihood of, of uh, contacting any, any disease. So I look at whether we start at Tarpon Springs, we have that outside court area there. We can certainly house some students in, in, inside the cafeteria. So principals are starting to design what lunch might look like. In addition to that, uh, some principals are going to have to increase the number of lunches so that reduces the number of students that they serve. You know, a lot of our schools went to that single lunch period where everyone's coming in and um, that's probably not going to happen. And in terms of let's divide it. So instead of having everyone there and, and there's some benefits to that too, but now we live in a different arena and maybe we can go back to that someday. But we need to chunk that out, uh, Ms. Kane, and, and to the board so that we have smaller numbers going. And we also have options of where to sit and where to go for lunch, not just solely in, in a cafeteria. Same thing with breakfast in the morning. Uh, we can't all converge into um, in a cafeteria in the morning, but rather in elementary, this is a, a problem as well as it is in high school, probably more so in elementary. So. We can bring students right into the classroom and bring the, that breakfast to them in that classroom instead of having 500 students going in crowded uh, cafeteria. So these are things that school by school basis, we give them, we give the principals and our leaders the framework. Here's what we're trying to do. And they're going to come up with the suggestions. And I can tell you, we're working through this already. It's amazing of how people adapt and, and really come up with some very creative ways of, of doing it and what might work at Frontier is not going to work at McMullen Booth and you know and but what might work at um, you know Campbell Park I was in their cafeteria it's huge and and uh, and Kathleen has all of those tables facing one way and the doctors and we said well bring them in here you know just maybe one more period this will be the safest place for them to and then you can sanitize this really well because it's a fixed location you're going to hear a little bit about that when we talk about graduations where you can control the environment you control the cleaning you increase it's where you you're all over the place and you can't control that cleaning to that point so I don't know if that answers uh, your question Miss Kane but um, I can tell you we're going to look at a plan and every every school is going to have a feeding or a cafeteria plan we'll call it uh, lunchroom breakfast plan um, because we offer a universal breakfast plan. <laughs> is that right it's, it's hard to speak remotely if, if, if it's usually yeah. you get facial so Miss O'Toole Sarah Thanks, Dr. Grego. Uh, so I will be talking about the big elephant in the room, which is what do we do when we uh, there is a positive case in our one of our schools or multiple of our schools. It is, of course, a very large question that I have uh, worked very closely with the Department of Health on to start to explore and set up a framework for how we respond appropriately and how we communicate that response to our families because all eyes will be on us the minute that there is a confirmed case in a school. I think we all have to acknowledge that um, the, no matter the mitigation factors we put into place in our schools, that the likelihood is with the upward trajectory that our county has been facing the last week or two, that it is very likely that we will have a positive case early in the school year. And so we need to have protocols and a plan in place by the beginning of August, for sure. This is an area where we will be leaning heavily on the Department of Health for guidance and support. And they acknowledge that and they recognize that and they have been our fantastic partner when we talk about this area. So on slide 62, um, this is only an example set up by the, um, the state uh, in their plan of a flow, kind of a workflow for uh, what to do for contact tracing. So the, um, we are developing a similar way of work locally with our Department of Health. Um, we do have a framework in place already because there have been instances, many instances throughout the years of communicable diseases that have come to school. Um, so for example, if a student is positive for pertussis, that's a highly contagious disease. And so we do have an internal communication protocol already. We have an external communication protocol with the Department of Health. We have a protocol already established for notification of families. 
uh, the goal of meeting with the Department of Health is to really look at the, all of that again in light of COVID-19. And does anything need to be changed, enhanced, tweaked, made stronger, kind of tighten up just to be sure that we have all of our bases covered? Um, because no, when school starts, nobody's going to be thinking about pertussis coming to school. They will be thinking about COVID-19 coming to school. Um, even with contact tracing in the schools, the Department of Health will retain the responsibility for notification of close contacts, making the investigative phone calls, asking the investigative questions. That will remain their responsibility. They are charged to do that, um, just like they've been doing throughout. So even though it says consider a contact tracing protocol, it will not be the school nurses or the school administrators calling those close contacts. So I just wanted to be very clear on that. Um, on slide number 64, responding to a confirmed case, um, like I said, the framework and process is already in place with the Department of Health. Um, I actually have a meeting with that, with the Department of Health Epidemiology Department who are the contact tracers. Those are the people who are doing it. Uh, we are meeting next Monday to um, explore some more questions, some more details, kind of flesh some of this out a little better. Um, the decision in bold to open or close a school program ultimately does rest with the local leadership of the school or program. Statutorily, it reads a little bit differently that the Department of Health does have the authority to come in and close a school for a communicable disease or a health concern. However, I know that Dr. Cho uh, greatly respects Dr. Grego, respects his opinion, and is happy to just to collaborate and have conversation about that, the dis any decision to close a school. So that is made jointly and not in opposition of each other. On slide 65, um, any school closure or dismissal, again, will be made jointly by the district and the Department of Health. So how, when there is a positive case, how long does a school need to be closed for? That's not gonna be a one size fits all answer. Um, as we've already discussed and alluded to, in elementary school, contact tracing is gonna be much simpler. You know, maybe we just need to close the school for a few days to clean certain areas. It's going to be, as you said, Mr. Dudley, much more challenging in a secondary environment where you have so much more, many more students, many more mix opportunities for them to mix and mingle. You know, and again, all of our mitigation factors, school is a social place. Um, I know I am a parent of high schoolers and they miss their friends. They want to go back to school. They miss their friends. They miss the interaction. Bless you. God bless you. Um, so again, despite everything that we put into place, I think we all have to acknowledge that there is no 100% guarantee that everything we put in place is not going to, you know, it's not going to mean that there will never be a case of COVID in our schools. Um, slide 66, all communication decisions to our families. So this is the communication um, to staff and parents and students when there is a confirmed case. All those communication things will be initiated by the Department of Health. They do um, typically during the school year, if there's chicken pox or measles or anything like that, they have letter templates that get sent to me and to the school administrator um, for distribution to families. We're gonna again, talk about that process just to be sure we don't need to add anything for COVID-19 that would be special or different. Um, anybody who knows me knows I'm very strict about HIPAA laws. So I am constantly reminding um, principals all the time and school staff that we do not discuss other people's confidential medical information. If the employee is positive and they wish to share that with their co-teachers, that's their right to do so. But that information should never come from us. Um, and so instead I frame it as it's an excellent opportunity to remind people of the importance of face masks, the importance of social distancing, the importance of hand washing, all of those things that we tend to become lax with over time. Um, even personally, when this all started about six, eight weeks ago, if you went into Walmart or Publix and you didn't wear a mask, you were a minority in that group. And it seems tables have turned now, six, eight weeks later, to where I walked into Publix and was wearing a mask and hardly, it was me and the employees wearing the mask. 
And so we people do become lax over time and we you know acknowledge that. Um, the school health staff will also follow up with families and students who have positive cases and staff members um, while they are on isolation and quarantine to check in, to keep them engaged, to let them know we're thinking about them, we're concerned about them. Um, you know, uh, a lot, many of our families don't have access to regular health care, and the school is their only point of contact for to see a provider of any kind. And so we don't wanna lose that relationship. We wanna use that as an opportunity to kind of foster that relationship. Another thing we're gonna do um, more preventatively, hopefully, is to um, put a larger emphasis on ensuring that students have a medical home. So helping families get, with kid, get hooked up with Florida Kid Care, get hooked up with a medical provider in the community, um, really making sure that our families can get access to care if and when it's needed for their students, not just for COVID-19, obviously, but also for all those other well child preventative type of things. On slide 67, um, cleaning and disinfecting, part of the internal communication protocol does include and will continue to include notification of someone in Clint's division um, so that they can properly, you know, begin their protocols, you know, uh, activate the strike team. That's what you call it, right? The strike team, activate the, the strike team and um, start to plan for how to effectively clean the areas that need to be cleaned in the time allotted to them. Um, the CDC does have guidance that areas should remain closed for 24 hours if possible before cleaning so that everything can sit for a little while. They do encourage opening windows and ventilation in Florida. I know that brings with it other concerns, um, but we'll leave that to the experts in Clint's division to figure all of that out. But the internal communication will include notification to plan ops um, or the operations division so that they can plan effectively as well. Slide 69 is from the CDC. This is a school decision tree that they had um, posted and published on their website. This section discusses response, of course. Um, if there's a confirmed person with COVID-19 in the building, doesn't matter if it's staff or a student, um, we assess the risk and then talk about a school closure, a dismissal of some allotment of time. Um, unfortunately, Pinellas County is still remains in the moderate or substantial community spread. Uh, column on the right, we are not the no community spread. So unless our trajectory changes, uh, we will continue to follow the steps. When there is a case, we'll follow the steps on the right, um, which is again, a lot of coordination between um, school health, the school district and local health authorities, the Department of Health um, includes all of that. Um, we will also use it um, any all positive cases as opportunities again to remind students and staff of the importance of all those healthy habits that we all have to become accustomed to doing. Um, and then on slide 71, there is a decision tree also for institutions of higher education that the CDC put out. It looks very similar, except it's a lot easier to say to adults, you need to stay home because you're an adult and you're not eight years old and mom and dad both work. You know, um, and so we we did include this slide just so that the board is aware that um, we also, when talking about these plans, also talk about our technical college and our adult education programs as well. Thank you, Sarah. And um, I, I want you to um, the board members to really understand this, like the EOC when they ask for schools as shelters, we close schools. So I don't want to get hung up on that slide. That was that slide was a little bit concerning to me too, is that it's not the Department of Health is this or that. No, it's, it's all together. In other words, the, we're going to issue protocols to the Department of Health. We'll take their lead on that. And I'll certainly communicate with this board as I've always done to, uh, to make the, the wisest decisions for the health and safety of our students and this community. So it's not a who has that authority, it's, it's the joint decision. And we've created that environment and that uh, culture here in our district. So with Dr. Cho and others, so yeah, yeah, that's, I want, wanted to just make that clear with the board. I think okay. that we, we Ms. Long, 
No, I'm going to Dr. Crick finish. I'm sorry. No, I was going to dovetail into instructional continuity. So if this is a good time, if you have a I, question. This is the teacher in me. Middle school kids, especially. Moms and dads have gone off to work and they're known notorious for coming to school sick. Okay, first period. Let's say you got a second period. You got a kid coughing and project, you know, when you cough and he doesn't cover his mouth. And there are signs and the teacher is concerned of the potential. Is there going to be a protocol that a teacher will do boom, boom, boom? Because you also then have to go back to the group they were with previously. Am I making? Yes. Okay. Yes, you so, are. Is there going to be a protocol to train teachers what what they would what do to in look that? for? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, there will be a protocol for an education for our, our teachers. Absolutely. It's, but because you're right, you know, you might get them fourth period, but they've been coughing in third period and second period and likely mm -hmm. first period as well. And so um, it will really be incumbent upon the nursing staff at the schools too to receive that student to the clinic. So the teacher will, you know, one teacher should, will need to send them, but we will have very clear, you know, um, kind of an outline of what things, there are minor things that can be handled in the classroom. And then there are things that definitely need to come to see the nurse about, because it will be the nurse who has to flesh out, is it a cold? Could it be COVID? There are many things that can cause a cough. Right, right. You know, and we will always err on the side of caution, of course. Um, to protect all of our students and staff. But there are some things that are will make it obvious to a nurse, a trained person, that it's nothing mm -hmm. of concern. But if it's a cough plus a fever, that's a different story than it's a, if it's a cough and it's high mm -hmm. pollen, you know? Right, right, or sore yes. throat. So yeah, throat. yeah, we will definitely be um, doing education with the teachers once everybody returns back on um, steps that they can take in their classroom to help. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I also have a question if no one else does. Okay. Um, has there been any conversation with the, the county for um, possibly having sick rooms at the hospital for parents that have to work rather than sending them to school? We've talked about having them if we find a student needs one in a school. Have we had any conversation about having things available for parents to drop students off at a hospital for, at that point, just childcare. Mm -hmm. Like a sick daycare almost. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sick yeah. childcare. I have not been a part of any conversation like that, but I can certainly bring that up, um, you know, with the county and the hospitals because, you know, the, the truth is the healthcare workers who work there also need care if their child is sick as well. Right. Yeah. And, and so I know they do exist. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it may cut down on the number of students that are coming. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, <laughs> and something that Dr. Grego alluded to earlier that I wanted to just briefly touch on too was using the parents, really educating our families and our parents on the signs that are concerning and really the importance of keeping their child home if they are not well. Mm -hmm. Um, because prevent, preventing them from coming into the buildings is the best thing that yeah. we can do if they are sick. Right. Uh, but then again, it's, you know, families with low resources or who struggle with child care issues and have to work, you know, and like they have Carson, to make the choice. Right. They exactly. may choose work, but if they have another option, another place. Correct. Yeah. So one Thank of the you. things we're we're not going to dive into is as uh, detailed as we will in July when we come back or at the beginning of July with the plan is is that we're going to discuss later on the onboarding of the summer but the details that we're getting into now are really good and, and thought provoking um, but we're looking at not only that parent screening but also we'll bring back to you a screening at the school level too so a parent and then once the students at the at the at the, the school gatehouse, well, how are we going to screen there, and then what to do with those students who perhaps, as you're describing, has that cough and symptoms mm -hmm. there. So first the parent screening, and then the 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 first period we'll call it, or homeroom screening at the at the school, and then and so we're going to be bringing back those things. But that that's a great decision tree type of situation. Then the isolated room, and it, it'll it'll all fit to, together. The 
uh, I'll dovetail into this part of the conversation as we head into the infamous Mr. Smith's 30 plus slides as we're coming up with the money <laughs> part of it. But um, there is without a doubt the conversation across this community and across the United States. I don't feel comfortable and what are the options? So the, the, our guiding light is the continuity of instruction, right? We, we, we cannot have these gaps of instruction in our community. So. Mr. Hendrick, if you could just cover some of this, and there, there's a lot more detail in the overall plan, just continue to remind yourself, board members, you have this full document, um, but we're, we're trying to touch some of the highlights on it. Mr. Hendrick? Sure. Um, slide 74, and there's several that come after that that uh, I didn't uh, put up there for you to see, but essentially it requires districts to have an instructional continuity plan. We have one, it's posted on our website. We built it as uh, we were over spring break. Uh, and so it's about 17 pages and it includes things like, how are we gonna take attendance? How do we issue grades? What resources should we use? Um, you know, what's the expectation for live lessons and check-ins and all those types of things. So obviously we've gotten a lot of feedback from teachers, from parents, from students, from school principals on how this fourth quarter went. And we are updating that instructional continuity plan in preparation for the fall. Um, one of the key things that's on this slide and one of the reasons I wanted to show it to you is, is the bolded part in the second, to, uh, second bullet from the bottom. It says uh, to determine best practices and flexibilities for seat time and instructional hour requirements in a potentially interrupted or even intentionally blended educational design. So as Dr. Grego alluded to, you know, there's, there's two things that are really easy to plan for. One is face-to-face. -face. The other is Pinellas Virtual School. We know how to do those two things, right? How do we do the part in the middle if it has to be blended either because there's an interruption or because parents don't feel comfortable? So those are the details that we're working out. And uh, I think you'll hear more about that as we go through today. Uh, you'll, you won't hear any decisions today. What we do have is, is our virtual school is open. We're doing registration. We're encouraging any family who's interested to look at that option. Uh, but what's in the middle are the things that we continue to work on. We've had a a great success with that in terms of student attendance. This plan outlines all the details that you need to have in there. Uh, but in terms of, is any family really ready to say today, this is what it's gonna look like on August 12th. I think we're all, you know, mm -hmm. today looks different than it did a week ago, looks different than it did a month ago. So we're planning for all contingencies uh, as part of this instructional continuity plan. Uh, and with that, Mr. Smith, long awaited. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hendrick. Uh, I have the next 133 slides, as Dr. Gregg mentioned. And I'm going to go through each one in great detail. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Thank Actually, you. I've only got 33 slides. So, um, I own them. See? <laughs> so, early on, when the with the outset of the pandemic, the federal government realized the uh, potential economic impact to the U.S. economy, and as such, they, they passed the. Uh, Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or the CARES Act. On March 27th, the president signed that act into law. And so we were awaiting information on the act for the last several months. In fact, we have meetings with our finance council uh, of the Florida School Finance Office Association every Wednesday, which include DOE staff, which includes Suzanne Pridgen and Mark Eggers, as well as Joy Frank, um, asking about when the, corona, when the CARES Act was going to become available. And each week we were told, soon. And then very soon. And last Wednesday, it was very, very, very soon. And lo and behold, the next day, uh, there was a press conference with the governor and he announced the details of the, of the CARES Act. So that was a $2.2 trillion allocation at the, at the federal level. And much of it went to states uh, and a lot of it went to educational institutions. What we didn't know was what it was going to be allowable for and, and what was going to provided within it. So last Thursday, the governor gave us some further details of what is allowable. And then on Friday, there was a webinar with DOE staff, which gave us some details as to how we go about accessing that money and the things that that money can be utilized for and, and the application process that's involved with it. As Mr. Hendrick mentioned earlier, there's a lot of information contained within these next several slides, but there's a lot of unknowns as well. So I expect we'll be getting some further details from DOE staff over the next several days um, to give us guidance. Uh, as to how we spend that money. You'll see some familiar themes within here. Some of the things that Mr. Hendrick mentioned will be covered in here because there's funding provided for it. Some things that Dr. Corbett mentioned as well as Mr. Herbick, there's funding provided in this. So you're gonna see there's a fairly recurring theme within the funding and a lot of it relates specifically to reading initiatives. 
So if you flip to the next slide, please. There are several different pots of money that were made available to the states. Um, it was about $2 billion that came down to the state of Florida for, for education and higher education. The first of which is the governor's fund. That's the $173.6 million you see up there. That funding is available, and I'll talk about a little more in detail about that in a little while, but it's available really for the summertime. They want a quick start to the spending of that money to be, to be utilized to have enhanced um, summer programs for our students to help prevent the slide that, that occurred during the last several months where they weren't able to attend traditional brick and mortar schools. Again, there's an application process associated with that. Um, that funding source, believe it or not, is available from June 1st through August 31st of this year. That's to be used in this summer. In the next funding source, there's a, a $770.2 uh, million dollar funding allocation. And there's two parts to that. There's a 90% allocation, which is going to local educational agencies, which is us. That's about $693 million. And there's a 10% holdback that DOE, Florida DOE can utilize. That's about $77 million. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a little while as well. And then of course, there's a higher education fund, which obviously doesn't impact us. That's $873.8 million. And there's a child care fund of 223.6 million. Within the higher education fund, however, there is $26.8 million to allocate it to technical colleges, which will impact us to some degree. The next slide, I'll first talk about the 90% and what's allowable on that. I'm just gonna go through some of these details. I'm not gonna read these slides to you, but essentially there's 12, and then really the governor talked about 12 criteria that we could use this funding for, but DOE clarified that and added two more. So there's actually 14. So basically it could be used for any activity authorized by, by ESEA of 1965, as well as Perkins um, Homeless Assistance Act. It's to provide for coordination of coordinated responses to prevent and prepare for coronavirus incidences. Um, providing principals and other school leaders resources necessary to address the needs of their individual schools. Uh, it's for low income children. It's for developing systems to improve preparedness and response efforts in, in the event of another corona outbreak. Uh, training professional development of staff and local educational agencies on sanitizing, Mr. Herbert mentioned that. Purchasing supplies to sanitize and clean facilities. It's for uh, how, to, how to plan for providing meals to our students in the event that this happens again. And it's important to note that this funding, um, again, was signed by the president on uh, March 27th. <coughs> However, the funding spending window opened on March 13th. So we can actually reimburse ourselves for expenses that we incurred back to March 13th from this funding source if we have identifiable um, elements that could be spent within, this, within the framework of this funding. It's also for um, purchasing educational technology. We did a lot of distance learning and we, we might continue to do distance learning. So we'll, we'll need to look at um, the necessity for, dis for technology for our students as well as access, hardware, software, and connect connectivity. It's for providing mental health services and supports for our students. Um, planning and implementing activities related to uh, summer learning and supplemental after school programs. Again, to prevent that, that slide. Um, sorry, could you flip up a couple of slides? up to page 86. There is. Number 12 is, is the broadest one. That pretty much says you could use the money to uh, maintain the operation continuity of services, which includes salaries and benefits. And so some of the things that um, Mr. Dudley brought up about the necessity for additional plan operations, that might be something we might have to do. Uh, and this funding source would be allowable for that. It allows for salaries and benefits, it allows for continuity of, of operations. So it's a fairly broad category, which enables us to, to spend the money in, in a, a relatively flexible way. And the governor early on said that when this funding came available, it was going to be fairly flexible. And that number 12 gives us that flexibility. The two items that are not on here, which were added by DOE on, on their presentation on Friday, is administration. We could take indirect cost on this, on this funding source to support um, the administration of the funding. And also equitable services was not included. Equitable services are those services that have to be provided to our, um, our non-public schools, um, much like Title I. Uh, next slide, page 90, is just a, a spreadsheet showing the various funding sources that are available to, to education. The first three are really an impact us. The first one, $223 million of the child care funding. The uh, 693 is the 90% of the $700 million that will go to LEAs. And then $26.8 million, as I mentioned, it's for um, our workforce development. We'll be receiving funding for that. And it's allocated by, by dollar amount, by headcount. So if you see um, the K-12, it's $212 per individ individual child within a district. So 
So the next page is a handout that you have at your desk. And I'll ask you to kind of focus on that. It's a spreadsheet and basically it breaks out the, the uh, three pots of money. Um, and I'll go through in some level of detail. So the, if you look at the very right, you have three columns. You have the, on the left-hand side, you have the governor's fund, which is that $173.5 million I talked about. The middle column is the 10% of that big allocation, which is roughly $77 million. And the right-hand side is that $223.6 million child care allocation. So I'm gonna go through each of these, these numbers within the spreadsheet individually, and each of them has, has a, supply, a slide rather supporting them, which I'll, I'll flip up on the screen. So the very next slide is slide 88. And this is the child care development block grant. It's a $223.6 million grant and to provide continued payments and assistance for child care providers, provide child care assistance to health care emergency response and sanitation employees, and bless you, bless you, and support providers for cleaning and sanitation and other activities to maintain resume operations, mainly um, child care operations. I'll Within, jump in, Mr. Smith, yeah. give you a quick breather, but this is where we'll get the funding for that rising kindergarten program. Oh, yeah. So it's specifically in there, mm -hmm. uh, to his point, uh, we have a phone call Thursday afternoon that tells us how to access it, what are the rules, what are the guidelines, who, you know, who's the teacher, how many hours, all those types of things. Thank you, Ms. Henry. So in the upper right-hand corner of that spreadsheet I have you focusing on is um, the very first number is $44 million. Everybody see that? Yes. And that's, that really doesn't affect us essentially directly. That's really for healthcare worker and, um, and uh, first responders, childcare expenses that they may incur. That's a $44 million allocation within that $223 million. The next amount is the $55 million emergency child care relief grant, and that's to support VPK operations, uh, both um, VPK providers, and, and it's available for VPK providers that open on as of April 30th. So if a, a new VPK provider opened on April 30th, they can get access to some of this funding. That's $55 million. The next night, item 16.9, or rounding up to $17 million, that's a high quality reopening support grant. That's to support closed high quality VPK centers, those centers that closed and, and now are trying to reopen, and also non-VPK providers. And again, that is to, uh, that is as of April 30th. The next part of that allocation is successful transition to kindergarten. I believe this is what Mr. Kendrick is alluding to. This is a $21 million allocation, which provides $18 million to implement summer pro programs for rising kindergartners, and $2.9 million to pilot a VPK program. And these are, uh, obviously these are statewide dollars. These are not in all county allocations. <laughs> Wanna make that clear. I wish they were. Yeah. We'll be writing to these uh, grants. Like for example, in our early childhood, we wanted to pilot what three or four of the VPKs as model VPKs. So we'll be writing to these competitive uh, allocations to draw down those resources. And keep in mind, as, as the board knows, these are non-reoccurring funds, but they, they certainly would be a good springboard to some of the things that we've wanted to do as a district. And that needs to start to be the theme of this conversation. So how do we transform our district to be a, a much more um, robust or, or engaged district in various ways of things that we wanted to do that we could use these funds to jumpstart it? Right. Yes. Thank you, that's great. that's a great point. These are non-recurring funds. For those of you who are around during the American Reinvestment Recovery Act funding that we get got back in 2009, very similar to that. It's a one-time allocation. You could use it and it won't be available next year. So it, as to Dr. Rigo's point, it helps us to pay for some non-recurring expenses to jumpstart some of those programs. So if you move your focus to the middle column, that is the 10% um, the of the large pot of money or the $77 million. I'm sorry. Let me first talk about, yeah, no, that's right. So $20 million is um, to pre-K three progress monitoring and data informed support. So it's to use screening and progress monitoring data to drive informed teaching. Um, it's to help leverage student data and deployment of professional development. So it's essentially modeled towards pre-K progress. Um, the next pot of money is a $5 million upskill, highly effective reading coaches. There's a lot of emphasis on reading for this. Um, oh, sorry. If we could flip this screen, please. Sorry, I'll pay attention. To Next one. Next one. One more. Thank you. There you go. So uh, slide 103 is the upskill, highly effective reading coaches is to train and develop highly effective reading coaches. They'll be up to 2000 uh, statewide. Um, the next slide, slide 104 is, um, 
Next slide, please. Thank you. It's a capacity building for reading. Again, reading $5 million. It's to monitor teacher and school leader professional development and how, effect, how to effectively use data and deliver high quality evidence support, supported reading instruction, as well as deploying resources statewide that, that have high quality reading instruction as well. That's another $5 million again. The next one on slide 105 is another $5 million to ensure high quality regional reading supports. It's to deploy re regional support teams, um, which would be 20, 20 regional reading consultants, what they're referring to as literacy SEAL team six. And they would be providing uh, roughly $80,000 in salary to those individuals, $104,000 with benefits. It would be a two year position to work regionally with school districts to help with uh, enhance, to help enhance reading programs. You certainly see the emphasis on literacy, uh, not only in the earlier grades, but some of the, the, the initiatives that didn't make it out of session are, are you see some remnants of it. And it's all good, it's all good. But uh, it would certainly jumpstart some of the reading initiatives uh, the state wanted to implement. So. And I should note that this, uh, this funding is available to um, local educational agencies, which is us, as well as charter schools and some uh, private schools private. as well. Not-for-profit not private schools will be receiving some of this funding too. The next pot of money is split between two columns on the sheet I have you referring to. It's, it's, there's $4 million in the governor's fund and $20 million in the 10% uh, column for a total of $24 million for ensuring the best curriculum for reading and civics. Uh, again, it's, it's um, focused on reading and it must be vetted by the FDOE's Just Read Florida office. And um, it's basically mini grants and matching grants for, for this initiative. The next one is what I mentioned earlier. This is from the $173 million. This is back to the left column now under the governor's fund. This is $64 million for summer recovery. It's to target students with significant ac academic needs um, it's for grades K through three uh, and four through five, uh, identified with substantial deficiency in reading um, based on the most recent available screening uh, elements. So that's, that's 64 million of the $173 million. And again, this $173 million is meant to be spent in this summer. So it's to be spent on, read, on summer initiatives right now. And so Mr. Hendrick, I know is working on that as we speak. Yeah, and, and to the point of Dr. Grego and Mr. Smith, you know, mo many of the things that we're doing, we think are the right things to do anyway. And so we're doing them. I mentioned the, the early uh, literacy program at our transformation zone schools where teachers are getting additional professional development. That looks very similar to what they put on paper here. Uh, and that's, that's for good reason. But whether they decide to fund us for that or not, it was the right thing to do and we build out a budget for it. So if we can get reimbursed, we will. Uh, same thing with our summer bridge program. We'll get reimbursed for that. Uh, but these are the right things to do for children either way. Uh, and that's what we'll continue to do. Absolutely. Thank that's you. a great point. And, and board members, you see the bold item there. There's still some question about the 64 million of whether that is only reimbursable if it's a face-to-face -face instructional program. So we're going to work with the Department of Education. Obviously, they have a they have a desire to kind of onboard in that dimmer switch way of bringing people back. And we do too in July. But uh, we're trying to secure as much of the 64 million that is uh, to to for the summer program. Yeah. So, and that's a great point. So, I think yeah. Dr. Carr has a question. Yeah. So, so sorry. A, I have a question then for Mr. Hendrick. For you had mentioned a June 22nd date. Is that a July? Is that a pre-K? The opening? June 22nd is the opening of our uh, summer pre-K. Okay. And is that a program that could fall within this and it's face-to-face? -face? Well, no, because we, there's a separate funding for that. Uh, the summer pre-K is already allotted for. Um, right. Those are students who did not use a voucher during the school year, typically students who are in an ESE program because that's they don't need a voucher for the school year program. So uh, that program won't be funded from here. Uh, but for example, as Dr. Grego mentioned, We've already had schools ask us, can we bring students in face-to-face -face for summer bridge, right? right. Yeah. Um, the challenge is we hired teachers telling them it would be virtual. That's what we promised them. But if they're okay with going in and if students are okay with going in and families are okay, then we'll do that. Okay. Good question. So the next uh, funding source is um, a $1 million allocation for additional strategies to support summer learning. And this is primarily geared towards our uh, outside service providers, summer program providers, YMCA, um, faith-based boys club, and it's to reinforce reading and math skills in those individual, those individual programs. 
The next allocation is a $35 million uh, rapid credentialing allocation. This is mainly for workforce development. And that's to increase capacity along short, around short-term demand for technical certificate programs, market-driven and in-demand clock hour programs, as well as industry certification. FDOE has, has identified 100 of these programs and they are to lead to um, advanced degrees in AS or a BAS degree. The next um, allocation is two and a half million dollars for a pathway to job market dashboard. Again, that's that relates to our workforce development program. And this is uh, consistent with the governor's initiative to have a number one workforce education by 2030. And again, with workforce development, we have a $10.9 million allocation for CTE equipment for infrastructure um, and equipment grants. It'll be allocated at $55,000 per district plus another 10,000 for each um, K-12 technical school in a district. The next one is kind of a big one. It's a free SAT and ACT. It's $8 million allocated statewide to provide free SAT and ACT uh, testing to 200,000 students statewide, roughly $40 per test and, and that's something that um, I think is probably a good thing. Yeah, again, this is one that didn't necessarily make it through the legislative uh, system this this uh, spring. But again, we, we do this as a district now. Yes. And when we went to uh, do our contract uh, that you approved with the college board, they said, well, why don't you just hold off on that school year test? We think something might be coming. So again, we don't have every detail, but it's the right thing to do anyway. And, and we anticipate offsetting some of our costs with this. We, we really push this issue in this governor's plan. And so it, it's, it's going to be good as, as well as some of the others too, but uh, it's, it's a, it's a good step. Uh, those students uh, lost out on the uh, SAT and ACT in the spring when uh, both these uh, companies canceled. So this is, this is good. So the next all allocation is another $1 million to help offset the cost of voluntarily administering the civics examination, the high school examination within schools. That's also from the governor's fund. The next one, Dr. Corbett alluded to, and this is uh, the reimbursement for supplemental health and safety protective measures for PPE or uh, protective equipment. So to the, uh, to the point about purchasing the masks, we can get reimbursed by FEMA. This is a request for reimbursement for 80, 87.5% of the cost for that. And the remaining uh, cost of that could more than likely be paid out of the CARES Act using that item 12 within the criteria. There is a $2 million allocation on the next slide, 121, for uh, telehealth, and that's uh, to for best practice to deploy telehealth throughout Florida for therapeutical, clinic, clinical, telemental, and, and telemental health services. Uh, I think Mr. Herbick talked about, I mean, Mr. Hendrick talked about this, instructional continuity plans. There's $8 million allocated for that, which is to implement distance learning in the event of recurrence of, um, of the COVID virus once again in the fall. And again, that goes to public charter and private schools as well. There is a $5 million allocation. Uh, this is within the 10% uh, for Florida, to help support Florida virtual school. Um, they're in, in anticipating an increase in enrollment in Florida virtual school in the event that this, uh, this occurs again. There's also a, a money available for their infrastructure in case they're in their concurrent usage, meaning that the numbers of folks that are accessing their, their uh, computer system are so high that it's causing difficulty with bandwidth this enables them to um, to enhance that slightly. Finally, there's a $250,000 uh, teacher training and virtual learning management systems allocation to help get teachers up to speed for virtual learning opportunities. And then there are two final pots of money. One is a $30 million allocation within the governor's fund um, to provide for Florida tax credit scholarships in the event that those decrease as a result of economic downturns. This will help to offset uh, the opportunity for those students to continue to get those scholarships in that event. And finally, there's a $15 million allocation for private school stabilization grants. There's a, there's a concern, uh, I think the governor expressed at his press conference last week that if a lot of private schools <laughs> begin to fail, um, there'll be an overburden on public schools for students to come back to us. I don't think I'd be concerned about that. I'd be okay with that actually. There'd be no burden here. No, no burden. we welcome them actually. <laughs> right. But anyway, uh, thank you. So that's, there's, again, there's a lot of details that, that haven't been ironed out yet. We'll be finding <laughs> more information as we go forward. Uh, we'll begin um, preparing these applications. They're due by the 30th of June for at least the two pots of money, the, the large pot of money as well as the governor's fund. So with that, if there are any questions. Dr. Carr? 
you you referred to charter and private is the allocation the same as um the SCA like it's allocated in the same format as our title money it, I believe it to is. those schools okay. there, there was some debate over that and um, initially it came out to be allocated by title one mm -hmm. then they talked about a different formula which I don't think has materialized so as far as I know it's it's a, it's a title one allocation. okay thank you anything else any other questions Oh, well, you, you've made it two hours. I mean, that was uh, yes. quite a lot of information. Great response. Um, we're still digesting this. I mean, as, as you say, so I know it's, it's time for a break, but I want to just thank staff and for, for really in a very quick turnaround over the weekend, because we just received this document of trying to help prepare the, this board, to at least the surface level. I would venture to guess that as a board, you're more informed about the governor's and state's plan than, than any board. And uh, I just want to thank staff and thank you for agreeing to have this special called workshop for this. And we'll build on this when we come back, but I uh, just want to say thank you. Can, can we say, I, I'd like to say thank you to you and staff for, I mean, it's clearly informed by many of the things we're doing in this district. So you can see the influence of Pinellas County in the plan, which comes from, speaks to the groundwork we have already done in curriculum instruction and right. in plant operations, as well as just the relationships that we fostered at the state level. So thank you to staff leadership and your leadership, Dr. Gregor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is where we were supposed to take a break <laughs> oh, okay. for technical reasons, so, but it's a good time for us to I take a break. I think we need a break, so whatever, all, so. Madam Chair. You... Um, 10 minutes? because we all can't go into the restroom at the same time. No. <laughs> okay, so let's Be do 10 around. minutes. We'll know where to find you. <laughs> Go into the end of Black Magic, but I just had the Zoom guy. The Zoom guy was in here.
had his own yeah. leadership team came back when. So the other thing that is interesting about our summer return to work protocols is it gave us a very good opportunity to pilot in a small way. We need to take the signage up to yeah. get it all ready this week. Yeah. Next no, week is the phase order right now. return. And then the following week, our expectation is everybody's back at work. That if, if you're on a contract that requires you to work a lot and half or 12 months, that you have returned to work. That would be the week of June 29th. And we've kind of pegged that all along as saying by July 1st, we, want, we, we don't want to be paying people to stay at home and um, and, and not be working. So, this. so that was kind of our goal as we went along. If you go to the next page in the document, and I'm not going to read this to you, but I want to show you the major sections that we addressed with, with the employees who are coming back. We had a, a section that we call the preventative processes, but it talked about the building updates, and that's the types of things like you know, sanitation stations.
time I'm only yeah. talking about this, but you know, this room I usually do when I'm in a room even this large. But the idea is we're trying to make sure everyone's workspace is someplace that they don't have to wear a mask. But anytime you get up and you leave your workspace, our expectation is you're wearing a mask. If you might be passing people in the hallway, if you go into common areas, the expectation is wear masks. Then we spell out the different places. And, and, and we even have a protocol here for meetings. We're, we're encouraging meetings to be virtual where they can. And even if you have to have a meeting of larger than 10, maybe half the people can participate virtually, half the people can participate face to face. But again, if you can't do the social distancing, we expect that you wear a mask. Um, and on the last page, there's some sections in here. It talks about things like travel and training and communication. Um, I will tell you that most travel we've eliminated for now. Um, training, we have an absolute expectation, just like we were teachers and the rest of the staff who comes back in 10 months, there is an expectation. We have training videos about what our protocols and expectations are. You, you must watch the videos and then affirmatively at the very end of it, you, you check the box saying, I watch it and I understand. And there's a, a section in the um, screening protocol saying, I understand it's my, my responsibility to answer correctly when I'm doing the screen, screening protocol. And then we have a section about communication with employees. We have tried to severely limit who communicates with our employees about any of these protocols because we want to be speaking with one voice. So any department heads or supervisors or principals that want to do a communication need to funnel it through the appropriate member of the cabinet so that we make sure we're speaking with a voice or a similar voice. So again, this was our return to work for the summer employees. It did not impact at all our 10 month employees who will be returning in the fall. What we're doing for returning in the fall, we have a timeline set up. We will be using a number of things. We will be using first and foremost, the CDC guidance. We'll be using the input from our advisory group that includes the local medical professionals. We'll be using the guidelines and recommendations that the state just issued on Thursday that we just spent a couple hours reviewing. We'll be um, looking at things such as the Council of Great City Schools has a set of protocols out. The um, uh, American Federation of Teachers put out protocols. There's lots of people putting out protocols. So we're looking at all of them. We sent out a survey yesterday that went to all of our employees, all of our families, community members, anybody can fill it out. It's just a, it's a public survey. Um, this morning when, when Jennifer Dull checked it, there had already been 25,000 responses. So we expect that to greatly impact the way we go about how we're looking at these things. Um, next week, the last question for those of you who haven't taken the survey yet, the last question on there is asking, would you like to be part of a focus group if we have one? And if you are, give us your contact information. We plan on doing probably six or seven focus groups. We wanna have three groups of parents. We want parents from all three levels. We wanna have three groups of staff, again, from all three levels. And we're probably gonna try and get one or two groups of students in as well, just to hear the student voice. So the goal is by the end of next week, we have all of the input that we can use. We've got our survey results. We have our focus group results. We have all of the various documents and sets of recommendations. As I, I think Dr. Gregor mentioned earlier, we're meeting tomorrow with our, our local medical advisory group. That includes PCTA. It includes a parent we put on there. It includes plenty of district staff. Um, what we're hoping to do is come out of that with some recommendations. We, we, we will bring in draft recommendations from our previous meetings, but we're hoping to finalize some recommendations, get the results of the survey, use that to ask, to form the questions that we ask the focus groups. But the, again, the important part is by the end of next week, we want all of the input in, and then we will be writing. We'll be writing a document that looks similar to this one that we just had up about summer, but it will be a return to school document. Clearly there will be some extra sections there will be the one about buses, there will be the one about cafeterias, be, you know, there, there's different things in schools that we do, we'll be adding those sections to it. But we expect to have a very well thought, well planned document that addresses all of the protocols we need in place. And we plan on presenting that to you four weeks from today at the July 14th workshop. And then I, I was aggressive, I wanted to say by July 15th, we would publish it to the community, but we, we wanted to buy ourselves a little bit of time in case there's changes that you have us make on July 14th. So we're saying by the following Monday that we will have a document that can be widely shared with the community and everybody will know what to expect 
when we open school on August 12th. In addition, you'll, you'll <laughs> board members, you'll, this thing is evolving. It's not like it's gonna you know, drop out or the sky or we're gonna go in a room and come out. So we'll be continuing to keep you appraised of the, the, uh, the developments as we go along. I'd rather get input along the way. This is, uh, you know, we've, we've heard some real common themes and common, the certain common denominators along the way that we continually hear over the last two, three months. And they're gonna continue to either be validated and, and said, this is a good direction, or they were gonna be told or suggested to go in a different direction. But certainly reaching out to a lot of um, feedback um, you'll be receiving your board documents so earlier than that, like July 7th, I guess a week before that. So please, uh, my encouragement is that continue to stay communicating with us about suggestions, what you hear, the various things. So we're on the Council of Great City Schools repeatedly. We're looking at other large urban districts and how they're handling and things. So we're, we're trying to learn as much as possible. At the same time, we're trying to open up a school district that uh, we typically have a set of work that goes along uh, the way, regardless of COVID-19. So um, this has uh, truly been a, a rewarding time, challenging at least, but uh, we'll get through it. We'll get through it. So any questions on, on this? Dr. Farr. I have a question. One of the things I heard you say, Dr. Corbett, was related to pay to stay home and I, I just want to make sure that we're, because um, I heard earlier about having a culture of compassion and that we're, and it's dependent upon supervisors. So for example, if I worked in this building and I could work from home, I mean, at one time I did work in this building and I could have mostly done my job from home. And if I, if it's feasible for me to work from home, I hope that we're allowing people to do so because I think that's for the betterment of all of us that then we reduce the number of people coming and going in the building. We have fewer people. And I know that creates a different culture or climate. And we may not have that in existence because we don't always function that way. Some schools really have that kind of a climate. Like if Eileen and I, let's say we're co-teaching or Ms. Sorry, Mrs. Long and I were co-teaching and you know, I was gonna be out for a couple of days because I had something, you would have my back and I would have yours vice versa. If I'm an immune compromised person and I work in an office, it would be, and, and I, this comes from climate and leadership that the person could work from home who needs to work from home. And I know they're illegal. I spent a lot, we spent some time talking, Mr. Kapersky, about the ADA, but, and contract issues. But I hope when people are working with their supervisors, if someone can get the job done at home, they're allowed to do it at home. And we don't come to the workplace with the mentality that, oh, well, I let Mrs. Long stay home, so I can't let Mrs. Carr stay home you know, because it has to be the same shoe fits for everybody. And I know that's hard to do as a leader because you have to have faith in the work ethic of the individuals working at home. But I think it's in this environment, it's safer for all of us. I'm just thinking about the summer opening. I'm not talking about at schools or in the fall. I'm just talking about this building and how we're working in this building and the safety of our employees here that if it's possible to work at home, that they're allowed to work from home. And have we given any consideration to, you know, extending the number of sick days? I know we have the extra ones from the federal allocation level and it's in the video. You did a nice job with the video, Ms. Texel and Sean, I'm assuming you and others had a hand in that, the whole tech team back there that, um, but, that, that just is concerning to me because sometimes I, I feel like when we say, oh, or like someone's getting away with something because they're working at home. And it really, we don't want to have that mentality like, oh, if you're working from home, you're not really doing a good job or you're only doing it halfway or who cares if you go out to Trader Joe's at 11 o'clock? As long as you get your job done, you know, you might be working until eight o'clock at night. There's not very many people who work in this building who don't put in 50 or 60 hours. 
So I don't, so, I just don't want it to, like I keep hearing that, like we don't want to pay people for doing nothing and we don't want to have this person feel like they're getting away. And I don't want us to have that approach, I, at least as a board member, I don't want our staff to feel like that. Yeah, we've never um, communicated that. I mean, it, it, there's so many comments and communications along the way. Some jobs are absolutely cannot be done remotely and some jobs can be done remotely. So these are our, our discussion points for, for the summer. And, and what we tried to do is to say that the supervisor can make that determination um, because every case is different. And, you know, and, and so we're trying to be uh, as you said, compassionate with people and still run the, run the business of the day. So um, nothing's off the table by any means by, by any of the employees. So, you know, we'll, we'll work with it. None of us have been through this before. So um, we just need to be patient and understanding and, and yet still try to work to get this, uh, get the district moving. I can, you have any? I can add a little yeah, bit to yeah, that. And yeah. first and foremost, the, what you just said towards the end, I, I do have to commend all of our employees for the job that they've done remotely. And sometimes yeah. that was not easy to do. Yeah. Um, but I will, I, I will speak for hopefully everybody around the table that, you know, our departments, our divisions have kept the work moving along this during this whole time. Um, you know, we are running a school system and that has been able to be continued because of the work that our people have really picked up literally in their carts and taken home and reset up at home uh, to do. And that's not with saying that many of them are coming in one day a week because things just had to be, you know, you don't have a whole office set up at home, right? So mm -hmm. they've been making their ways, but I, I will reference what you, what you were just asking about. And we are looking at each person individually. And actually we're working on a, a form that's almost ready to get going just to help our supervisors with those discussions that if somebody does have a request uh, to work remotely, that first of all, there needs to be that discussion. You know, it's just, I'm going to continue working from home. Well, let's talk about that. And as we are all moving back to the work site, now the work happens here again. How is that going to work out? So um, we're going to get that out to our supervisors too. And it is a phase in approach. And this is why we needed these couple of weeks to really have those conversations with our employees to find out how is it going? What do you need? Is there, you know, and those discussions are happening um, at this time, but again, it all doesn't happen within an hour for over 2000, um, mm -hmm. 11 and a half and 12 month people. So, um, so yes, uh, we are looking at that and, and making those um, for the summer. Uh, work and, and trying to be very understandable. I think I've pretty much talked to every division head just about a, a, an employee or two or three in their division that um, has that request. So we want to be able to provide them with that. So very good points. And, and I think that week of June 29th, that's our target, right? Just like we're trying to write a plan for August 12th to be a target to have 100% return to school. So we, we have to have a target when we're doing the planning, but we know there's lots of exceptions. Exceptions. Here. Questions. Other any other questions from board members? Okay. I'd like to move on to the uh, third and final topic, but highly related to everything we talked about, and I'm going to end off with um, not that this wasn't a highlight, but I want to end off with uh, what I think is uh, is a really exciting time for our school district. Um, I'm going to send, I was checking with Jennifer whether I sent this article to the board members. I'm going to send it today, if, I, if you could remind me, uh, Ms. Bell and, and others. It was, it was an article posted in the New York Times from Thomas Friedman, talked about the leadership. And um, interesting article uh, that I shared with each of every one of our principals in, in April to say that this is a stress test for all leaders. Um, this is uh, Stress test is set from the White House to the schoolhouse, from superintendents to board members and to board tables across this nation and really the world. It also talked about the organizations that were going to come out ahead were organizations that were able to pivot. And you'll see it, hopefully I'll do it some justice, like in basketball, where you're going in a direction, all of a sudden you plant your foot and pivot into another direction. And how organizations, school districts in this particular conversation can pivot is going to be really determined how they rebound and how they go in a direction that benefits the team, benefits our, our district. 
I think that this PCS Connects, and uh, as we're titling it, is one of those examples of how we're taking this, 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 this issue of the COVID-19 and everything we went through, and, and just one example, there's going to be more. I will uh, commit to this board, have charged our district to be an innovation district, a district that thinks outside, not, not only the box, but also how do we continue to improve student achievement? How do we accelerate that student achievement? How do we take what we've learned over the last nine weeks and leverage it to the future in terms of what you just heard about, you know, millions and millions of dollars of CARES Act that will not be reoccurring, but will will we'll have an impact on our district and how can we make it so that it has a distinct impact on student achievement? That's our, that's our lens. I want to share with you a, a slide that um, can take a step backwards a little bit and say that for, since the beginning of public education and really as we know it as a school day, there's been a, what I call the historic fixed variable and that's time. Uh, it's been five hours, 900 hours equals one FTE, Mr. Smith will tell you. 900 hours is 500, uh, five hours a day. Um, it's 900 hours, it's 25 hours a week. You multiply that times 36, you get 900 hours, you get one FTE. Isn't that the math that the FEFP is formulated on? And so the historical fixed variable that we've had in education is five hours. We've also tried to, in many initiatives in our district, like Connect for Success, where we looked at our Title I schools and said, let's try to, ad, ad, let's try to expand that instructional time. Let's provide you some technology, internet uh, capabilities and connectivities, and let's try to expand the practice time. Let's try to expand the need for um, perhaps a, a more intensive remediation because you're not getting it perhaps during the school. We need extra practice. And then we bring on this concept of equity and increasing because without a doubt, the increased quality instruction has forever, the first time anyone's ever done any research on, on education, increased quality instruction has always increased student achievement. That formula has been true no matter what. So if we want to increase the quality instruction and the time beyond the five hours. Now, the, without a doubt, and Mr. Hendrick will be working with me during this presentation, but I can say to you that one of the things we've learned is that the student teacher interaction is the most powerful type of, of instructional uh, across the across the board that, that student teacher interaction verbal nonverbal encouragement all of those things that were kind of lost i'm not suggesting that remote learning is doesn't have its place or isn't effective at all but i'm just say, saying that in the center of all of this that teacher student interaction is is extremely strong variable and the degree we can increase that time is the degree the state provides us more than that 900 hours, which is, is fixed. So how do we increase the quality instructional time and provide that increase of time, not just for some kids, not for kids who, who perhaps has the, they, have a, they have a livelihood that, 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 and support that those, those things are increased regardless whether they want to or not, but rather that quality instruction is increased for all students. So if you take a look at that box on the right hand core, how do we increase the teaching and learning? How do we enrich those talented and gifted students so that they're never bored in school, but rather there's always an extension to the classroom at five hours a day. How do we provide that student in number three who truly does not get it right in the classroom, but needs that extra help? I don't call it remedial, but it is, it is extra help outside the classroom. How do we answer the question to the parent of say, your, your student is, is really truly struggling in mathematics in these three concepts. And the parent's next question is what? How can I help my student? We're providing that extra, how do we provide skill development? How do we just flat out practice something like a musical instrument? You got it, you know how to play, but now you need to practice and you need to skill develop. And time being a fixed variable doesn't offer that luxury to all students across the way. And how for a, um,
we're going to see these these five things really come to fruition. I'm not going to go through this, Mr. Hendrick will, but I wanted to graphically show you that the more we pivot, the more we leverage, the more we move in this direction, not to give up and never to say that that, that instructional time with teacher and student has to be by far, first and foremost, the most impactful ones. But you know, there's other means that we can continue to partner with our outside agencies and many other people and our parents. One of the things we've learned over this nine, not in the last nine weeks is some of our parents have, or families that perhaps were, were, were disengaged with us became engaged with us because they answered that question. We answered that question. The situation answered that question is how can I help my student? How can I engage with my student? Before the, the question, the answer was very difficult. But now we have those ways and pe people are getting very accustomed to working at home and in school, like we did with our own, uh, uh, with our own work. We, we started at sometimes at 6.30 or 7 and guess what? I, I tended to go in that same office in my house at 9, 9.30 because I wanted to continue to engage. And there's nothing that stops our students from practicing and doing more of it. It's not more FaceTime in front of a monitor, that, that we don't want, but what we want is more, more engagement with high quality instruction. I believe with the CARES Act, with the 90% that our district is po posed, poised to, to truly uh, move in a direction that we can build upon our grade levels and, and, and have our teachers and the skills that they've learned and some of the training that you saw in that CARES Act, I want your mind to go back to the CARES Act now in terms of virtual training and literacy issues and many other those other, other issues and circle it back around so that we as a district can pivot on this and provide access to all students. So I asked Mr. Hendrick to dive a little bit deeper in what we mean by these five areas and how we'll get there. Thank you, Dr. Grego. So I'm going to stand because I want to point to a couple things up here and, and uh, do a couple of other things to, to demonstrate this point. But as a school district, we know our vision is 100% student success. And if you think of that, as Dr. Grego said, sort of in a circular way, think about how everything that we do supports our students. So if you look at that blue uh, layer there in, next to the green, you'll see that every classroom matters. And, and direct face-to-face -face teacher instruction as Dr. Grego said, that interaction between teacher and student, the interactions between students and students that make them grow academically are the things that make them grow socially, emotionally, build other skills in students. And we don't wanna, we don't wanna ever get away from that. And that blue part of teacher to teacher, teacher to student interaction will always be the core mission of what we do. In the orange part, part we've layered in teaching and learning. What are the resources that we provide to students? What are the resources that we provide to teachers? How do we build all of those things to support 100% student success? And, and the little visual Dr. Grego just showed, I'll come back to in just a second. And in the outer layer is that stakeholder support. All the community groups, all of the families, all of the churches, the Juvenile Welfare Board, the Pinellas Education Foundation, everybody who has an interest in seeing students succeed also support that 100% student success. And Dr. Grego talked about that sort of traditional model that we've all, all of us in this room are very, very familiar with. And when we can increase that quality instruction, we increase student achievement. So if we make better resources in the orange, if we give teachers better curriculum, we do better training to how the, uh, help them teach reading better, or help them teach civics better, or whatever that is, we see an improved outcome. But what we're proposing to you and to our community today through this PC, uh, PCS Connects project is to add an additional layer, that dark blue layer of digital connection. It does not replace face-to-face -face teacher instruction. It doesn't replace community supports, but it enhances and is a glue that brings all those things together. So what we're proposing is a one-to-one -one device initiative for our school district unlike others that you perhaps have seen across the nation. Uh, we have been very thoughtful in talking to stakeholders, uh, including groups like our Pinellas Classroom Teachers Association, our teachers, our parents, our students, hearing about their journey. And what we don't wanna do is ever go back to a time where the only students who can learn and explore and enrich themselves are those who have internet access in their home or those who have a device with a camera or a device with a touch screen can only do certain apps where other students can't. 
it's just not fathomable to us anymore. We've seen the power of what students can do. We've seen the power of families involved in that, and we don't wanna go back. And so as we look at this, we're proposing this layer of PCS digital citizenship that enhances quality teacher and student interaction, that gives teachers the ability to differentiate on an even greater level because of technology, not just in the classroom, not just the six computers that everybody gets to rotate through three times a week, but any time of day, day or night, on the weekends and beyond. It increases instructional time, as Dr. Grego mentioned, and it most importantly bridges that equity and access. It eliminates any student not having access to that. So let me go back to this, this diagram that Dr. Grego shared and just talk about how if we knew every single student had a device and had internet access at home, how does that change the resources that we provide? So from a core curriculum perspective, we've never placed our core curriculum online. It's been online for our teachers. They pull it down and they access it. But what happened in the last nine weeks is they took that core curriculum, put it on digitally, and every student and every parent could see it all the time. And whether it was a video or a short lesson or just simple text on a page, people could go back and reference it over and over and over again. I don't understand this new math and how you used an array to figure out what eight times eight is. Why don't you just teach them to memorize 64, right? So instead you could go back and watch that visual one time, two times, three times. Okay, I understand where they're getting at now and I see where that's applicable later on. In our core curriculum, as we enhance that and build it out, not to build a full digital curriculum, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in taking the best high quality curriculum we have and making it available to every student, every parent, all the people in purple on the outside of that circle who can support us in that. Students go to JWB after school. They've never had access to our core curriculum before they have had, had access to iReady. They've had access to other things that we use to support our core curriculum, but not all of it. When you look at enrichment, there's a million ways to look at that. And I'm gonna take you through an example of that in just a second. But one of the best things we saw from digital learning were students creating projects at home using secure methods like Flipgrid and other things that we taught teachers how to use and students being able to showcase their home, their family, their excitement for their work and share it back with people. Share it back in a, and I don't have to go on YouTube to do it, right? So the world sees it, but I'm sending it to my teacher, to my classmates. We've seen great formative assessment checks. And, and again, I'll share one of those in a second. In terms of extra help, that's real easy to understand. I want you to envision if, if you knew in this district, we had a really great AP Human Geography teacher. And if you've thought about it, we do. We know who those people are, right? They have high pass rates every year. And AP Human Geography is a tough course. Students take it for the first time in ninth grade. It may be their most rigorous course they've ever taken in their life. Well, what if it's seven o'clock every Thursday, that AP Human Geography teacher, we paid them to do it ELP, like we normally would pay them to do it at 2.30 in the afternoon. But what if they did it at seven and it was open to any student in the district who could log in and check out what are the tips and tricks for the last two weeks curriculum that I should know as a student? So even if my teacher in my class perhaps isn't the most experienced, hasn't had the greatest success in this curriculum yet, I'm getting a lesson from an expert. I'm participating with other students and building my knowledge across the district. Those are the types of things we envision. You're familiar with flipped curriculum where a teacher films themselves and then posts it online so you can watch it. Again, we saw a lot of that in digital learning. That's how we really started before we experimented with live lessons. If those things are there all the time, any student can access those. Our summer bridge lesson, the first week as I was going in and, and scrolling through different every grade level and just looking at different curriculum, the first video I happened to click on, total coincidence, was David Martinez Cooley, our teacher of the year from, uh, from Lila Davis. He did a video and every single student across the district got his lesson on Monday morning when they logged in. That's really powerful, right? He worked with Jonathan Ogle, he worked with Mike Feeney, he worked with Holly Slaughter. They all produced a lesson and every student in our district received that. Up until the, uh, you know three months ago, only the students at Lila Davis got to experience Mr. Martinez Cooley. Community resources are there as well. We're familiar with skill development, it's probably the easiest one. We all understand things like satpractice.org and all of the resources we give online. And when you talk about exploration, one of the things that isn't up here although we're doing virtual field trips right now in Summer Bridge, you had a presentation a couple months ago on Naviance, our new college access tool. Up until a couple months ago, all we thought about 
was doing those lessons in class, right? How do we get counselors in front of students and get the technology and get a lab and not interfere with testing? If we provide a device to every student and internet access, that changes the narrative. Here are the modules we want you to work on. Your counselor is coming to your class tomorrow to talk to you about those things. And when students have things that are about them, they do them. There's never an a problem getting students to take self-interest inventories because it's about me. So I wanna do those things. So we envision PCS Connects bringing all of these resources together. How do we know that teachers will embrace this? Because we've asked them. We did a survey of teachers, uh, a random sample of 20 schools. These weren't the most high performing teachers in digital learning, these were every teacher. So anybody who had success, anybody who didn't have success, and we asked them, if you knew every single student in your classroom would have a device in class and at home and internet access, would you use technology to increase student choice? The answer, 90% said I would do it right now. Well, increasing student choice is a culturally relevant teaching strategy. It makes students want to learn, want to engage in the content when they have choice and what that might be. 89% said they would use it to differentiate to meet the needs of students. Right now, they said, not next week after I have more training, not after, but right now I feel comfortable in differentiating if I knew students all had this. And 79% said they would record lessons of themselves so that students would have access at home. So we've asked our teachers and our teachers have said, we want to do this. In your handout uh, that, or that was sent with you that was posted online, we also did a convening of 200 teachers that were nominated by their school principal uh, as a real innovator in digital learning. And so just like we've done convenings before that I think I've shared some of the results with you around teachers who had high VAM scores or teachers who got great learning gains, we did it with digital learning. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We had breakout rooms online. Uh, and what the teacher shared was just fascinating. But we came away with sort of five high-level takeaways from teachers around digital learning. Um, they said that the creative instructional approaches show great promise, that they were able to be more creative perhaps than they ever have, and that lit a fire with them. They said that student interest in technology is strong, but that computer literacy varies. Just because I know how to get on my phone and text and tweet and access YouTube doesn't mean I know how to write an academic letter or access Microsoft Office the right way. And so we need to be better at teachers as a not a constant structure and that teachers knew that students needed that. So I wanna take you on a, a quick activity as the head of teaching and learning and Dr. Grego said, yes, you can teach the board something. I, I had to do this. So I, I want you to open I, up I, your I computers. Good luck. You said it with a different twist. <laughs> yes. <you. laughs> open up your computer and I sent these to Ms. Kane. So she may have logged in three hours ago. Listen, I just finished the my exam, and so I can't do no more work. <laughs> um, so I want you to go to nearpod.com. I'm on the challenge. I'm being a defiant student. <laughs> There's one in every group. Yeah, I know. And when you get to Nearpod, you're going to see a couple different buttons, and one of them says students join a lesson. And in that, where it says students join a lesson, there's a code you're going to put in. And I've given you the code. And then when you get in there, just put in your first name. Oh. 
and you're going to choose a little character to represent you after you put your first name in. <laughs> Wait a minute, my Microsoft Teams is popping up and stopping me from work. So. Okay, I'm Hang sorry, in there. My sound on. There we go. Okay, now we got it. H I E N X. Which are you? You can keep the music on. That's okay. Oh. Can you run your mouse over those characters? <laughs> Good. All right, so Mrs. Kane is in. Thank you, Mrs. Kane. So Mrs. Long, Mr. Dudley, Mrs. Flowers. Oh, it said choose your right, character. We're waiting. Here we have the car. Cute. We've got two more to go. Oh, look at Bill. He got on a bed. <laughs> I thought about being it. Being short. <laughs> <laughs> How did I do? Two oh, just choose a character. Two people. Anyone doesn't matter. Same character. It's, uh, it's nice to not choose. Renee and Eileen. Renee and Eileen. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he did, and that's how he came up there. See, didn't tell me how to start. You said only I would see my name. <laughs> I still had it on on um, cap lock, and I was getting ready to do it because no, you're the one that sees your name. <laughs> she told me the same thing too. Well, one more to go. There needs to be consistency. <laughs> Why I'm not passing up this thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take my name off. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, take my name off. No, 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 no. I just moved it off. You'll still see it, but it won't be up there. Oh. Okay. Took introduction. Oh, I don't know who's doing it. Stop. <laughs> I got the challenge. Oh, oh it hit start. Oh, there we go. All right, so all six are in. All right. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to propose five questions to you, and there are four choices for each question. So when you see the question, you're going to read the question, you're going to uh, click on the answer that you think is correct, and you will get points both for a correct answer and the speed with which you answer. And after each question, we'll have a leaderboard here on the screen oh to show how goodness. we're doing. I'm going to get so serious. Still saying, Wait, uh, yeah, because we haven't hit start yet. Oh, so okay. we have all six. Board members, are you ready? Ready. I'm ready. All right. Sean, if you'll hit start, here we go. Oh, boy. What's the Oh, so for those not playing, how many computers did Pinellas County Schools loan out during the fourth quarter of this school year? Oh, snap. Oh, dang. Oh, 26. All right, we've got our leaders on the board. Question two. 20 seconds during the instructional continuity period in an average week, what were the total number of logins to Clever by Pinellas County School students? Gosh, I'm going to <laughs> okay. Let's see. Oh, I'm getting see. I'm not see. Doing Three seconds. Well. Me neither. Does it look like we had a lot of correct <laughs> answers there? That's all right. Question three. <laughs> During that same period, in an average week, what were the total number of logins to the mathematics digital platform Dreambox? What we use in K5 for online math. Oh, oh snap again. I have some right answers. <laughs> no vowels. Really? Can I call an expert? <laughs> Question four. What percentage of PCS students qualify for free or reduced lunch? Oh, let's see. They're pure here. I can't yeah. remember. I don't know which of those. Uh, I'm going to go. Mr. Herbeck's Probably giving you a hint if you look. Go higher. Go high. Go high. Go high. Oh, all the way to 60? 
All right, everybody's on the board. Okay, last question. Mr. Dudley's in the lead. <laughs> Which of the following were lessons learned by PCS teachers during instructional continuity as measured by the digital learning convening facilitated by T teaching and learning? Oh, that's yeah. a test strategy right there. <laughs> Why is mine not working? All right. There we go. That's it. And so we have a winner. So we, Sean, you can take the leaderboard off. So what we wanted to show you, or what I wanted to show you, was what can happen. You could have posted on Facebook. Yeah, I'm on the stand, y'all. I'm on the stand. Me too. So I wanted to show you what can happen if every student has a device, right? We could have easily gone, and I could have presented to you hey, we give out 26,000 computers and students logged into Clever a million times a week and about 80,000 logins to Dreambox by 40,000 students every week, right? And with 60% of our students are free reduced lunch. I could have presented those to you. We could have sent them to you in an email. But because you engaged in it, number one, it was fun. Everybody had to do it, right? One person wasn't dominating the conversation. There was equity in, in participation. And this gives you a chance to constantly be engaged. So a teacher could have just presented that and we could have done it in game. I could have given you all a whiteboard and said, write down your answer on the whiteboard and hold it up. That's not a bad strategy either. But this was fun. It was engaging. It's one of, obviously, millions of people saying, hey, this happens to be this. Happens to be this happens to be this. It's a tool that we have Right? What if we did a lesson like that with one of our best teachers, again, for 30 minutes, once a week, to bring this to life with students? It gives every student a chance to participate like this at home in school, right? And so that's the type of connectivity that we're talking about. We can build one of those Nearpod lessons, and that's in fact what we're doing for Summer Bridge. All of our ELA is on Nearpod. It's not just quizzes, but you can put out videos, you can put out text. Kids can talk, they can write right on the screen to one another, they can save it and send it to their friend. So it's just another way that we can engage students. And if we make one of those here, that can be used, that same quiz could be used by every first grade teacher in the district, or that same video, or that same whatever it might be. So moving forward, what is it that we're looking for in addition to a computer purchase, which Dr. Corbett's gonna share in a second, but it's also a learning management system. Most large districts in the country have a learning management system. We have never had one for a variety of reasons on a full scale basis. Um, years ago, we had one called Moodle. You may be familiar or remember Moodle. Um, Moodle was free, it had some cost. Then it sort of became obsolete for a number of reasons. <laughs> You're probably familiar with others if you've ever done any kind of digital learning, like maybe Blackboard you've heard of, uh, Canvas, you may have heard of Schoology is a popular one in the state of Florida and across the country. So we, um, during this digital transition period, we started to really examine learning management systems in greater detail. And we formed a committee of about 30 teachers, some uh, school-based principals, um, had Joanne McCall from PCTA on there. We looked at a whole host of learning management systems and uh, kind of whittled it down to two and then eventually selected Canvas as one that we felt would best meet the needs of our district. We actually already use it and partner with them. That's what our Pinellas Virtual School uses as Canvas. That's what our hospital homebound program uses. And any of the virtual courses that are taught in our high schools for virtual graduation credit also use Canvas. So it's not like it was brand new to us, uh, but we have about 9,000 licenses in our district. So next uh, week at the board meeting, one of the things we'll be bringing forward is a request to purchase that. We're actually gonna purchase it with our referendum dollars once again, but it, it allows us to connect all these things and also address one of those needs that I mentioned earlier, which is consistency. When you have a learning management system and you upload a resource in first grade or 12th grade or any course, it looks the same for all students. And so parents, students, teachers don't have, well, this is what first period looks like, and this course looks like that one, and this teacher posts their week, you know, schedule for the week over here, and this teacher posts it over there. It still gives you a lot of flexibility in how you, you do it, but it's organized in a systemic way. 
And it also takes all of the resources that we've already used and it has interoperability with them. So Canvas does not have a live lesson function. It uses Microsoft Teams. So all of the work that we've done on Teams to do live lessons is not lost knowledge. It just integrates it into that platform. I think I have the clicker for the next slide. So bringing these things together helps to build all of this momentum. It helps to take what Dr. Grego said, elevate us out of this digital learning better than when we went in. And we feel confident for, from teaching and learning, from the community services and all the work that Lori and her team have done to connect students and families to the internet. Um, and Tom Lechner, who's here, I think I saw Tom, there he is. Um, and all the work that they've done to help outfit families with technology and even out, outfit some of us in this room. So the CARES Act gives us some ability to do this, and I'm gonna pass it to Dr. Corbett to talk a little bit about our plan from an operational perspective to go to one-to-one. -to -one. Thank you, Mr. Hender. So early on during the, um, the closure that we had, as the excitement built with teachers and with teaching and learning about the potential for going to a one-for-one, -one, we started having conversations and talking about it. And I said one of the things that I almost never say, I told Mr. Hendrick, I want you to come back with a plan. I don't want you to think about the funding of it. Don't worry about the money. Just come back with a plan. That's the best plan we can do for Pinellas County. And I'm telling you, I almost never say that. But if you notice in this PowerPoint, one of the things we're talking about is leveraging. And so I want to talk now about how we can leverage some resources to make this come to reality. One of the things that occurred about a month ago was we got notice from the property appraiser's office that the tax rolls in, in Pinellas County went up farther than we anticipated. It was three or 4% more than we anticipated. We currently have a budget every year for a technology refresh and a good portion of that technology refresh is for st student computers. So what we asked the budget department to do was to take the majority of the increase and shift it towards student computers so that we could beef up that budget for this initiative. Then additionally, when the CARES Act came out, and, and one of the major things in the CARES Act that they talked about as an allowable expense is to buy technology and to pay for training for technology. We thought the time was ripe to leverage both the CARES Act funding and our capital increases, and that we could, we could make a significant impact on this plan. So if you go to the next slide, I, I know one of the things that's on everybody's mind is the 26,000 devices that we pushed out into the community to help our students who did not have internet connectivity or a device at home. One of the first things we said was we must maintain that, that we cannot collect those devices and, and, and bring them back and then all of a sudden have a large chunk of our students that don't have connectivity. So you can see in our plan, what we're going to do first is because we have to do maintenance, we will collect the 26,000 devices, we will clean them, and there's both two ways to clean them. We, we, we you know, we'll sanitize them, but then also we will re-image them and, and rebuild the hard drive so that they are back to, to a, a state of newness. And then we're going to redistribute those devices. Now, when we redistribute those devices in August, what well, I want to I want to jump ahead now to September. Okay. In September, what we're proposing is to provide one-to-one -one devices to six grade levels. So if we come back to August, when we go to redistribute them, we will not need to redistribute them to those six grade levels, right? We will take those 26,000 devices and distribute them back to the, to the six grade levels that are not getting one-to-one -one devices in the first year. What that allows us to do is a lot of those computers are used for classroom or testing labs and things such as that. So in those six grade levels who are not in year one, they'll take half of the devices, which is 13,000, which is roughly what they had before, and they'll use them at their school for classrooms and testing and all those other things. <coughs> they'll take the new 13,000 that they're getting that the other schools don't need or the other grade levels don't need, and they'll send those home with the students. So that in the, in the grades we're not doing in year one, all of the students who are not gonna get a one-to-one -one device will still get a device to bring home should they need one. Then if you go to September, and what, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, putting an agenda item in next week at the board meeting to purchase 42,000 devices. We have roughly 7,000 students per grade level. So what that will do is it will enable us to go one-to-one -one in grades um, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. I want to talk for a minute about why we chose those. One of the reasons we thought it was important to do middle school in its entirety, because middle school is an area that, that we sometimes are looking for an attractor for every middle school because a lot of our families 
they, they have anxiety and they're anxious about just going to middle school. So we think this will make middle school much more attractive. Then we wanted to make sure both the other levels were, were connected to it. So we went with grades four and five in elementary and grade nine in high school. So again, purchase 42,000 devices. We, we, we put the purchase order in next week. The devices will get here two, three weeks, probably the, like the first or second week of September. It'll be after the 10 day count, the dust will settle. We'll distribute those to those <coughs> six grade levels. The following August, we buy an additional 14,000 devices, which adds two grade levels. So we can go to grade three and grade 10. The following August, we do it again. We go to grade two and grade 11. And then in August of 23, which is three years from right now, we will purchase the last two grade levels. So we will have grades one through 12. We don't think kindergarten is appropriate. Kindergarten will always treat different, but in grades one through 12, we will have a one-to-one -one device initiative fully in place. And the important part is by leveraging these care dollars this year to get us that jump start, we have then pushed ourselves forward so that our existing budget in our capital outlay plan will, will fund this in the, in the years after 2023. We'll be able to fund this every year and it will just change the face of instruction and change the way we use technology in our school system. All right, thank Mr. you. Andrew? So the last two slides, I wanna connect back to the, the pink part on the outside of that circle that we started with, the stakeholder engagement. Uh, we have seen great results in connecting with our families uh, from them just watching teachers teach to the conference week that we did to end the school year to try to find and share with them how did your child do and what do you wanna do this summer to continue to support them. We've also continued great relationships with other uh, entities such as the Pinellas Education Foundation. But we'd like to create and establish a digital learning parent and community advisory board to help lead this effort. That as we launch this Pinellas County uh, Schools Connects initiative, that we continue to stay engaged with the, the folks who we want to uh, help support our students the most. Over this course of the last nine weeks, I'm sure, quite sure many of you in this room have received emails from parents and community members about the technology's working, the technology's not working, I need help with my child. We've talked to all those folks and even if they were angry at the start, in the end, whether it was through email or phone call, they were all really just trying to do the same thing that we all are, and that's to be successful with students. And so we've already invited some of them. Uh, some of the, the ones that we've gotten a lot of emails from are just, you know, said, hey, I have a particular expertise in business, and this is what I do, and I think I can help. We've asked them, if we started an advisory board, would you want to be part of that? And the response has always been yes. And so if you approve these initiatives, we plan to launch this uh, parent and community advisory board to support digital learning. And we'd also like to invite a board member to participate in that advisory board. It'll meet quarterly. Sometimes we'll meet digitally, uh, imagine that, um, to get input, to share the statistics, to find out how we can continue to connect to community and parent resources. So the last slide, uh, before I pass it back to Dr. Grego, is just to connect back to the core values that we have as a school system. As Dr. Corbett uh, mentioned, he challenged us with saying, if you had no budget, why would you do this? What would it look like? What would the device be? What would the resources be that you would need? What would the teacher training would be? And we built out a plan that outlines all those things and we've worked side by side with PCTA and others to help do that. But mostly, if you look at our core values as a school district, two of them connect exactly to this initiative. And the top bullet, I think, is the one that resonated the most with me and as we always look to our strategic plan and our core values to make our decisions, making decisions and committing resources to attain each student's success speaks exactly to PCS Connects. For all the reasons that we've said, we want students to move forward, we want our community to move forward, we want student achievement to move forward. So I'll pass it back to Dr. Craig. Thank you to uh, staff members who've helped put this presentation together and the thought process and many uh, hours of of putting it together over the last several months and uh, talk about pivot. I mean, that, that to me, this is, uh, we have so many initiatives in our district, elevating excellence, the career academies, uh, how we've restructured so many things. And we keep our, our, our eyes and our, our target on student achievement. I just think this is a, a tremendous, uh, you know, next step for, for us. From a fiscal financial point of view, it, it re, looks at what we mean and redefines refresh, but it's a refresh at, with the teacher and the student at the heart of that refresh. And uh, so we've always had a, in this district, a refresh plan for decades. And 
And so now it's time to maybe bring that refresh to another level. So one of the things I heard really loud and clear is that, that with the seed dollars, with the CARES Act funds, that we're able to stay within budget as we move along and it's not gonna cost us anything uh, more, but also builds a tremendous platform, that LMS platform is what we needed too. So um, let me let's stop there. And if the board has any questions, you'll be seeing um, this, this and discuss, but I wanted to discuss it with this board first. Can, yeah. I ask, can this be used to help families you know, I always talk dropout prevention, ESC, the lower economic, mm -hmm. they're always looking for homes. So they're sometimes they're moving from one part area one to area two, and every teacher's classroom is different. So some don't have the same foundation. Could this kind of build and fill the gap when these children are moving? Mr. Hendrick talked about consistency, uh, which is a key term in, in this. And what this does is it provides a platform, no matter where you're at, you're able to be so exposed to and access to understand. high quality instruction. Oh, that, that's wonderful. It, it would, and, and just to your point about uh, students with disabilities, they actually, we, we saw some of the greatest gains with students with disabilities during instructional continuity because yeah. ESE yeah. teachers were able to literally meet with students one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. um, sort of the way that you would expect specially designed instruction to occur. And so that was a great benefit. And, and it's one of the benefits and it was, it was loosely mentioned in the exploration column, but not having, um, we can provide experts to families virtually in other ways and become more efficient. Um, so Love even that. the fact that, you know, you want to have an IEP meeting, you need a, a specialist there who's a speech and language pathologist, right? Fine. Instead of saying, well, we can only schedule three today because the first one's going to be here and the next one's over there and the next one's over here. We can do five or six in a day and just do it virtually, right? That's right. And parents can even log on from home on that computer, which all parents did over the time, right? And the parents that don't have transportation, right. this gets them involved. Right. This, so, is from, this is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking my experience in the middle school mm -hmm. and, and the children were, you know, this might have been their fourth school by February. Yeah. How can they have consistency and continuity and get the parents involved? This, this is perfect. Other questions from the board members before we move on? Okay. Yeah, I think it's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. You'll be seeing uh, um, documents and LMS and next time and, and the board, the purchases, the refresh plan, uh, various things. So please, if you think about something over the next week or two, though, and, and you, you have a question, this, this, is, this is growing. This is exciting work. This is also, uh, in some ways, energize our staff. I mean, we've been so inundated with, um, the rightfully so, COVID-19 and its impact and things like that. I mean, there's been this real desire to wrap our hands around this instructional uh, achievement issue that we're actually in this business for. So it, it's, it's a great balance, but uh, I'll send you that article about um, leadership and, and it's helped uh, our district. So uh, with that, that concludes our, our, our comments. I have one other, as I mentioned, so I'll leave it to the board chair if you want me to dovetail right into an right update on graduation. Discussion. Yeah, let's do that. And then um, do, do other people have items for leadership discussion? No, I, I no. Okay. I have one after you do. So you, you do uh, yours first. Dr. Vasquez and, and Ms. Matway can come up and um, maybe I'll lead on, uh, open this up as they're passing out some things. You know, we've, we've worked uh, over last month uh, with graduations. First of all, again, thank you. I know Sean and yeah, Beth, you. we, we have a, we have a virtual graduation that's being completed. And let me say, I've, I've looked at some parts of it. And I know you have too, Dr. Vasquez and others. It, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. The, the virtual graduations will be a keepsake for the 2020 graduates along the way. And I know no one's listening to me because you're all looking at your handouts. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that, that, that so that's a horrible teaching that. strategy. Yeah. <laughs> So with that, I'll just turn it over. <laughs> I'll give up. <laughs> Got my attention. I'm no, sorry. it's all right. So we have met with our uh, partners. Uh, I want to give a real good shout out to the uh, Spectrum uh, 
the Phillies, the Phillies, even though they beat the Rays in 08 in the World Series, I still <laughs> like them and um, I tolerate them, but they're, they're a good organization. They're great for clear water. So um, minor league baseball is not returning. The Spectrum Stadium is open. Dr. Cho and his staff has been with us. We've made some visits to the stadium. Uh, one of the things the Department of Health is, has asked us as a school district is to try to standardize into one location the procedures for graduation. And what, what that emphasis did, and I won't go into it long term, but what that emphasis did for me was it took off the table, everyone just go to your football field and go at it. And what that did, they, they begged us and really pleaded with us to try to establish the protocols, very similar to what Polk County did. They went into the Tiger Stadium and they had these protocols and everyone graduated there. Everyone knew exactly what the expectations were instead of just say, okay, we're going to go to St. Pete High School and, and people are all over the place. So they were really pleading with us, kind of back to my discussion mandate and, and really coaching. And so when we went to the, Phil the Phillies Stadium, um, they truly wanted to help and be the graduating venue of all of our high schools. They wanted to help our, out our community. They have a stadium in which they are very capable of conducting. In fact, in, before I arrived here as superintendent, they used to graduate, I think, six or seven um, high schools at Spectrum Stadium, then Bright House Stadium. The more we got into it with the Department of Health and, and doctors and others, the, the, the greater difficulty we experienced about bringing people in, checking them, the crowds, and everything we went over earlier with the um, state report. But we still wanted face-to-face -face graduations. So I kudos that I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Vasquez because she's and also with Lori. Um, and, uh, and, and you've been working with our senior high principals. So our charge has been to the principals, stay hitched, let's do whatever we can. And then I can tell you, I'm gonna sing the praises of the high school principals. They have stayed, they have kept the fight and um, they're all united and they all wanna do this no matter what it looks like. But I think the plan they came up with is just really tremendous. So I'll let Dr. Vasquez uh, introduce this. Thank you, Dr. Grego. So as Dr. Grego just spoke to, we are in a very good place with our, our plans for our graduation ceremonies, our live graduation ceremonies. And as he mentioned, throughout this process, we have been hand in hand with the entire high school principal group, really talking things through, really talking about what, what, what were the potentials, what were the things that were essential, et cetera. We've also formed a smaller task force with high school principals that are really helping us hammer out the very specific details so that all of the ceremonies are very similar in their protocols and in their safety measures, of course. There's also a, a huge district uh, team that's working together. It's Mrs. Matway, Jennifer Dahl, Beth Herendine, Matt Bloom has been a huge part of this. I don't want to leave anybody out, Sean Clark. It's just a really good group of people that are working together to make sure that we're on the same page. We've covered all of our bases and we're, we're in a really good place. I also want to shout out to Keith Masterides as the principal who's been using Spectrum Field now for several years his deep insights into what happens there and what we can make happen there have been key. So the way we like to describe it is that we have maximized, or pardon me, minimized risk to students, families, and staff, right? But maximized a very personalized graduation experience for families. So I like to describe it just a little bit for you. You can see the dates. We have four dates set up uh, during the week, actually. It's, yes, Tuesday through Friday. All right, and you can see the times. You'll see that we've got stage times for arrival of students, so we're staggering students. We're going to use two gates for entry points for students, 25 students per gate, staggered every 15 minutes. That's going to assist us in making sure that as the get graduates are arriving and as we're conducting what we're calling our processional live graduation ceremony, we can keep all of the requirements of social distancing in place. We've purchased masks for all of our graduates that'll have their school logos on it in class of 2020, and they're very cool. You're going to want them as well. <laughs> they're, they're very attractive, so we know that the graduates will be excited about wearing those. And literally, if you can imagine this from a parent's perspective, how personalized this will be, they are going to be able to, up to a guest four, four guests per graduate, 
walk onto the field with their graduate, okay? Again, maintaining social distance, but either up the first baseline or the third baseline toward a center stage on second base, okay? And then at that point, the graduate will separate from the parent. The graduate will go up on a stage, up on risers on a stage, across the stage as their name is being read. They'll have that opportunity to take a photo with the principal like we know all, all students and all parents want to keep for, for a keepsake, right? A permanent keepsake. And then when the student uh, exits the stage, they'll rejoin their family and then they will actually literally exit the field again. So at no point will we have large numbers of personnel or, or students or graduates, you know, sitting together in any one area, et cetera. So again, we minimize risk while maximizing that personal experience. Parents would be able to, with their phones, right, videotape that process and take pictures of their own kids up on stage as well. The other thing that we, uh, I didn't say at the beginning is that before each of these dates, so for example, our first set of schools are Tarpon, Pinellas Park, Country, and Osceola. The night before, we will air their um, virtual graduation ceremonies in their entirety. So they'll be able to see our principal leader speaking, our student leader speaking, the greeting from Dr. Grego and Mrs. Cook, and I believe Dr. Carr is doing St. Petersburg High's greeting, or has done, I should say, St. Peter, Petersburg High's greeting. Yay, okay, I thought there was a secret, I thought, oh, all right. <laughs> so they'll be able to see the, the entire ceremony, their kids' names will be called out, their kids' uh, pictures and their names will be on slides, et cetera. So they'll see that entire ceremony, and then the next day, they'll be able to experience that processional. We are really excited about that. We have great plans for the diploma pickup in a very safe way as well, that'll actually get them out of the Spectrum parking lot into, the, into another parking lot very nearby where there'll be a dr car drive-through. So we have worked so hard in conjunction with the health department the spectrum officials who do this so, so very well, so that we're gonna have a very standardized protocol to make sure that we maintain the same integrity and process throughout every ceremony. We, we tried to get a second venue in Lang Field and just um, they were unable to provide us that, that venue. Um, wanted to try to divide and conquer, especially location, but it just wasn't gonna happen. Um, they have soccer going on and just wasn't able to accommodate us. The, when I talked to Dr. Cho about this, and especially, I'm gonna be frank with you, with, with the, with the um, rising cases that we see, he became more concerned about the audiences coming in to Spectrum, not the graduates. And he said, the optics of this is not going in the right direction. So when, Rita and Keith and many others came up with this suggestion, he was elated because it does away with that. Um, he said, we were good, we're good to go. And that's the kind of partnership we're having. The Phillies would have to spend approximately four hours in between graduations, spraying every single seat and every single, it was just a huge cost. Um, and we could probably graduate maybe two to three if we're lucky a day, which would make this over two weeks at best. Mm -hmm. So the parent up, up close process of walking in, you can screen then the four guests, the graduate, mm -hmm. have that to be very intimate in terms of the walking out in the field, make it special, the keepsake with the virtual graduation. We run this by, people are really excited about this. Mm -hmm. Now the good news is that we're able to run through a lot of graduates pretty fast too. <laughs> So as you see, I, this first time I've seen this schedule, you, you see that on the Tuesday through Friday, we'll be finished with graduations and in our district. In addition, I think Dr. Vasquez, also the second page, we have our EAS graduations that are just as important. And we're gonna select the same procedures. Parent, graduate comes in, graduate comes up on stage at Largo High School, professional photographer is there. Parents stays below, able to be very close, take their own photos, share that, walk down the stage and walk out the auditorium. And we're able to do that um, both at Lakewood High School Auditorium. So there we're, we're gonna divide the district uh, for, for ease of access. We, we believe that this plan is um, the best given the circumstances, given the health concerns that are out there right now. Everyone will be, um, 
having to wear a mask. I know Rita, you purchased yes, those with the yes, graduates. Sir. If you've taken a look at Polk County, they just finished, I think they're still working on it over at the Tiger Stadium. Um, they require it, but their crowds are still, they're all there um, and they're far away from their graduates. So we believe this is uh, actually an enhancement to the graduation ceremony. And if I could add one detail, Dr. Greco. So the the actual processional piece will actually be live streamed as well. Oh, yeah. So that if there were a, a someone at home that could not make it to that could not be part of the four guests that are allowable or someone in another state, for example, right? Or another part of the state, they could actually see that live streamed piece while their graduate is going across the stage. And then my understanding is that Sean and his fabulous team and, and, and Beth Harrington and, and the team, right? They are going to be able to add that live stream piece to the tail end of the virtual ceremony. So when the parents get that final keepsake, right? They'll have the entire virtual ceremony plus the actual live stream the day after that virtual ceremony airs as a keepsake. Awesome. We may be setting a new standard all the way around. I'm telling you, yeah. Let's hope we can go back to <laughs> traditional uh, uh, what about, uh, graduation. Mm, like a faculty member. Yes, thank you, Mr. Dudley. So we absolutely have the faculty members involved, those who wish to come, and also those who will have some roles and responsibilities that will need to help, you know, support the students, checking them in for the name cards, et cetera, all the things that you know so well to do. So absolutely, we will have staff, staff there as well. We'll have a tent, um, my understanding. Yes. So the principal obviously is the key person, but other faculty members is that there are off contract, but we really would love to have them there. Uh, they could be a part of that, that ceremony under the tent and we certainly want to keep them shaded, but we will need workers also as we stage these individuals. What we'll do next is that, because uh, no one knows the schedule at this point, what we'll do next is that we'll start communicating uh, frequently asked questions Plus we'll establish some sort of instructional video or this is what the expectation is gonna be. So if, um, if, if Rita gets a card that say you're gonna be there um, at seven o'clock, then only that colored card or that time slot, we're gonna clear you and you go and graduate. So there'll be people all the way from seven o'clock to 8.15. We're only taking those time slots. So it's like you have a ticket, you, you're in the time slot. Everybody else stay in your car. And, and progress that way. Did I miss anything? You did not. We're in a great place. I hate well, to beat it down. I know what happens in the rains. We Bring walk them really fast. Bring your umbrella. <laughs> Umbrellas, galoshes. It, We've also established rain days if necessary. Yeah, if, if we can go into the following yeah. week, but we do have the following okay. week. We're very hopeful that we can get them all through in the four days. We're just not going to say that. <laughs> There's going to be no rain until no we're It's been so we're not going to do it. Do it. <laughs> the beauty of that tent is that, is that you're under <laughs> the beauty of that tent and the short walk from the third base uh, bullpen to second base, and then from second base to the third base um, bullpen. We're going to hold those clouds up for a while. It'll add to the experience. <laughs> Any questions? I think this is, um, I think this is really cool. It's an awesome way Different. of making up hey, for what we've done. No shake. No, 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 you have to schedule before anybody else. So any, any uh, you, you can see that on it, if you want to be there on a Tuesday, if you want to stay for four, but um, it's going to be limited, limited. Uh, and we've already been represented with, with everybody. So um, maybe the fewer, the better. We will send that out. And anyone who wants to be in any of these days, please be helpful. All right, I have just one thing before we leave and I appreciate you all staying as long as you have. Um, what will Tuesday's board meeting look like? Are we going to be at the dais? Are we gonna have tables set up like this? Are we all coming? What is? We, because it, it's still in June and we have the ability, um, I'll leave it to the board, but I was planning on still remaining to have um, a virtual meeting, yeah. making it optional. And so we'll, well keep the same structure that we have here. 
Okay. I know it's virtual because we already decided that, but is it, are the tables going to be set up like this for our board meeting because we're going into a workshop right after? Yes. Okay. Oh, so we're coming here. Yes. If, if you feel comfortable, yeah, I do. come here. I don't Either here so or online. So what time on Tuesday we have to be here by 10, right? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a 10 o'clock meeting. Okay. Tuesday is 10 o'clock. Yeah. And then no meeting expulsions. and then workshop follows. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. So is the cafeteria open? No. Okay, so bring our own lunches if you're hungry, right? Because we do the meeting and then we go right into a workshop. Okay. If that's okay with the board. Well, that's what I'm, I'm trying to. This. That's yeah. why we wanted to use so this as a kind of a test case. Meet here at 10 for the board meeting and then go into the workshop. Just remain right here, go into the budget I think so workshop yeah. and the strategic plan. Yeah, and we also have the workshop afterward. That's why I'm right here. We wanted to just kind of space around the room to have something to eat. We have the conference table, we have the oak table. You know, I have other tables I can set up to where. You know, you spread around the room. You know, you can let me know what. I'm just saying, if people want something to eat, bring it, and then we can go in there or go to our separate offices yeah, or whatever. You want to do I just, it and, um, I'll make sure I pick up some stuff just in case. So okay. I'll get some bags of snack. You know, I'll get some stuff right. just in case. So we will conduct that next week the same way. Yeah, that's why I was. That's why I was checking. Yeah. So we'll, we'll do it in anyone um, wants to we'll, everything virtual will still be the same we'll still be doing it in zoom so if you, if you so choose if you don't feel comfortable don't do it you know you we, like miss kane today is virtual and she participated so um, we'll be here but uh, you could successfully complete the board meeting virtually next tuesday but I'm going to be honest with you, the, the reason why we did it, the budget um, workshop is going to be tougher to do virtually because if you remember, Mr. Smith had that notebook that he's planning on providing you, um, even though it's it's a little bit of a stress a stretch be, because of the time, but that's a tough thing to go over, but we will post it and if you want to. So if you're here, you're going to be seeing a hard copy of that. Yes. A little bit easier to do. Mm -hmm. We usually have the notes. Is, right. is, that, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. If everybody could be here about quarter to 10, I think it might be better to make sure microphones are working and all of that kind of stuff. So, okay. Leave your name tags right here. No one's going to be here. It'll be all right. Thank you very much for the morning. Very productive. Thank you. I would like to move my position.